been debating on sharing this for a few weeks now, and I figured why not, right? I mean, spooky season is practically here already. So, this happened back in October of 2013, during my senior year of high school. My sister, who could really be called a medium, and I had been browsing the web for urban legends when we stumbled upon an article about a game known as the Game of a Hundred Candles. In short, this game was a, a sort of ritual, very similar to the way Bloody Mary is supposed to work. So, to put a long story short, the people playing this game had to light a hundred candles and tell a ghost story and then blow out one of the candles. At the end of the game, you should have conjured a hundred separate spirits. And, like every ritual game, it warns you to play at your own risk. But, no big deal, right? None of these things are real. So, we found a night where our mum wouldn't be home until after 2am and planned for our game. My sister, her best friend T and another friend N, and myself prepared for our night. We waited until our mum left and for the sun to begin to set and then we proceeded to set up our kitchen. We set up a hundred tea candles on the counter and found a box of matches and as the sun sank lower, we shut off the lights in our house and opened up our glass door so the smoke from the candles wasn't too bad and turned off our cell phones. And around 7.30, once it was perfectly dark, we started the game by lighting the candles. At first, we just told light-hearted stories, like I saw a ghost and it went boo kind of thing. As we finished the first 10 candles, there was a, a palpable change in the atmosphere around us though. But the air had a, a static feel to it and the hair on my neck and my arms began to stand on end. As mentioned, my sister qualifies as a medium who can see and feel things that are not apparent to the naked eye, and even she began to squirm in her chair. As we started the next set of candles, 11 to 20 this time, the house became painfully quiet and the stories also began to grow darker. The stories that we told went from silly folklore to real-time accounts of just strange things that we had seen. As the candles were blown out, we began hearing creaking and cracking around us. Now, we did live in an older house, but... The house never groaned or cracked, well, at least not this loudly before. So, we finished the next set of ten and everyone playing was visibly beginning to feel uncomfortable. I mean, the laughter had stopped and a more somber tone had taken over. Again, we ignored the strange sounds and just continued to play. As the time passed and it grew closer to 8.45, the game took a, a sour turn though. The cracks in the creeks became louder and more frequent, and as the 25th candle was blown out, we heard the distinct sound of someone pulling into the driveway, shutting a car door, and walking up the deck to enter through the glass doors. We waited, but the motion lights on our driveway just never lit up, and nobody ever came to the door, and then we heard footsteps leading back across the deck and out of earshot. One of our friends suggested that we paused to look outside and make sure our mum had not returned home early or something. And she hadn't. At this point, my sister suggested using a dowsing pendulum. Our friends agreed and we laid out the rules of clockwise for yes and counterclockwise for no and saying goodbye and whatnot. My sister then asked the room, is someone here with us? And the pendulum began to rapidly swing in a clockwise direction. Our friend, Anne, asked, is there more than one of you here? And the pendulum began to swing clockwise again. Anne said that this was some sort of bullshit and took the pendulum himself. I asked, did you come because we played the game? Again, the pendulum swung clockwise. And finally, T provoked it by saying, if you really are there, why don't you prove it? And promptly we heard a loud thud against the wall behind us. We decided that we were just freaking ourselves out though and someone must have been fucking with us and had obviously managed to throw something in the dark to make the thudding noise. But curiosity got the better of us and Anne suggested that we just keep playing so we did. He told a story about seeing a spectre in his dreams once then seeing it in real life. 
he put out the 26th candle and two others blew out. At this time, my sister, she became visibly frightened. The reason was unknown to us until later, but she claims that at this time, she saw a solid black mass moving down the hallway towards us. It felt like the house had become 10 degrees cooler after this candle was blown out too, and we all felt that. We sat in silence for a moment before Anne says, If you're really here, I need a sign. And this is when shit just really hit the fan. We heard heavy loud footsteps coming down the hallway and the doors creaking open. The flames of the candle started to waver with no wind and Anne grabbed my hand and whispered that something was breathing behind him. Even though I'm seated to his right and my sister and her friend are directly across from us and we couldn't see anything. Anne freezes up though and then turns around suddenly with nothing behind him. And then, with nothing near it, the doors that we had left open slowly creak shut with no wind present. Then, T says that someone is touching his arm and then his neck and then his face. At this time, we just decided to stop playing. I believe the exact phrase was, fuck this, I'm done, say goodbye. So, we did. We extinguished the rest of the candles and began turning on the lights and moving as a group. And although the candles were out and the game was over, there was still this really heavy feeling all around. We moved to our dining room where we had heard the thud earlier to turn the rest of the lights on. We entered the room as a group and turned on the lights and Halloween decorations littered the ground like they'd been thrown from their original places. On top of our server was my mum's old battery powered witch. Her motor had burned out years ago and we never put batteries in anymore and she was just simply sitting there. But we started hearing a, a cracking noise from the corner of the room. We slowly turned around to see that the witch was rocking and bringing her wrinkled hands together slowly getting faster and faster until the witch just fell over. As her body hit the ground, we heard the loud bang of a door or cabinet slamming shut somewhere else in the house too. And suddenly, our friend T screamed that his face was burning. We turned around and he had a small scratch on his face and a trickle of blood was running down his cheek. And that was it. We grabbed phones and keys and just ran out of the house, dropped our friends off and didn't return home until much, much later. When we did eventually return home though, another friend came over to stay up with us until our mum got home. We turned on cartoons and cranked the volume and just tried to ignore the banging and the footsteps and the heavy breathing that wandered through our house for the rest of the night. In the years following our night of playing a hundred candles, we've seen quite a bit of activity in our home. I've shared this in other places, but I sincerely believe that this was a catalyst for the activity in our home. I have since moved, but my sister, she remains in our home and still frequently experiences a phenomena, including seeing the shadowy figure occasionally. Hindsight is twenty twenty, and we really should have listened to the warnings, I know, but we were young and curious. Many years ago, I worked on an ambulance first responding to 911 calls and all that. One day, we were dispatched to a, a person not acting right type of call. When my partner and I arrived at the apartment complex, the first thing we noted was that all the people, except for the patient that were living in the same unit, they were standing outside with terrified looks on their faces, shaking violently. It was raining and it was nighttime outside, but I quickly approached them and asked what was going on. The 25-year-old male looked at me and said, Yeah, so uh, we were just playing a game when suddenly my girlfriend just started shrieking and screaming. All the lights went out, including the candles, and then we saw her lay on her stomach on top of the board game. My girlfriend's head, hands, and legs, they all went into the air, and then suddenly she just fell to the floor, stood up, and ran into the back of the apartment. My partner and I then cautiously walked up the steps to the apartment door with the mag lights. Now, the door was already cracked open, so I politely knocked and introduced myself as a 911 ambulance paramedic before walking inside the apartment unit. Now, the light switch didn't work, but 
I could hear a, a creaking wooden noise in the background, just squeaking back and forth. All the walls were painted dark colours like black and maroon, and it was obvious that these people liked heavy metal, skulls, and dark paintings because they were represented all over the walls. I started walking through the apartment calling out for the patient, looking for any sign of her. As I walked deeper and deeper into the unit, it just started getting colder and colder. Finally, I saw her in a, a rocking chair. She was slowly rocking back and forth and just looking straight forward. I introduced myself to her and asked her what's going on. There was no answer from her and she just kept rocking back and forth. I got up close to her looking for any medical abnormalities and her eyes were so dark. Either her pupils were that big or her eye color was just that dark but all of her other vital signs were pretty normal her blood sugar was normal she didn't appear to be having any seizure activity or anything i tried to get a painful stimulus out of her by squeezing the shoulder or a sternal rub but she wouldn't even flinch i couldn't find any track marks on her too for drug use or anything and throughout all of this she just kept rocking back and forth, just looking straight forward. The rule of thumb for paramedics now for this situation, and not being alert to person, place, time or event, is that she needs to go to the hospital. I tell her that since she's not talking with me, I'll be moving her to a stretcher. And suddenly, the rocking just stops. I mean, all sound everywhere just stops. I can only hear breathing noises now. Well, I lift under her armpits and my partner lifts under her legs and as we lift, we notice something really strange. The patient stays in a seated form, like completely rigid. We lay her on the stretcher and wheel her to the inside of the ambulance and as we load her into the back, cracking noises like a breaking tree branches filled the air. I look over at her and notice now that she's looking right at me with a a huge scary crazed smile on her face and no matter where I moved her head and eyes just tracked me with that same unwavering smile too my partner looks over at me sympathetic knowing that I'll have to be in the back with her I playfully say good now maybe you'll talk to me we begin riding to the hospital and the heat was on full blast in the back of the ambulance but no matter how hard we pumped it it just wouldn't heat up. But she was still smiling that big toothy smile and staring at me too, and not answering any of my questions. I looked down to grab my pen that fell on the floor and then looked back up and, out of nowhere, the highest pitched screams and shrieks filled the air as she started lunging at me and grabbing at me. She clashed her teeth and bit at me in my direction, trying all that she could to break loose. Luckily, the stretcher seatbelts were secured to her, making me just out of reach. The huge crazed smile broke into a frightening look of terror and then anger and my back was against the wall of the box. Luckily, we were already at the hospital, unintentionally a Catholic one mind you, and as the ambulance drove in, the patient stopped all she was doing. She calmly looked straight back forward and just went mute again. We brought her into the ER and talked with the doctor about what had happened, who, needless to say, was pretty astonished by the story. So, a bit of backstory first. I've been best friends with this girl since uh, high school, I think. For probably close to 15 years now, in fact. I used to practically spend more time at her house than my own. Her parents are great people, and they treated me like another daughter because my parents are pretty awful themselves. However, my best friend started dating a guy about a year and a half ago, and since they got serious, we haven't hung out much at all. She has since bought a house and moved in with him too and I spend a lot more time at their house now but it's been nearly two years since I've spent any time in her parents home aside from going over there for the holidays and whatnot. At some point though, within the past year or so, her mum got really into estate sales. She would go and buy antiques and then either fill her house up with them or try to resell them on eBay. 
I don't know if this is related to the experiences that I've been having, but I find it hard to believe that these strange occurrences have nothing to do with all the objects belonging to the dead people that they now have in their house. Anyway, my best friend's parents contacted me about pet sitting for them while they went on vacation for a week. I was glad to do it because I owe them a lot and honestly, I love their three dogs. I've known them since they were puppies and they had the three dogs shut in the, the tiled kitchen or dining sunroom area using a baby gate. That way if there were any accidents, it was easy to clean since there was no carpet. Plus, the oldest dog, a bulldog, overheats easily so he likes to be sprawled out on the tiles. The bowls of dog food and water were left out for them and I was supposed to head over there for two or three times a day to just spend maybe an hour there. No big deal. So, the first day I showed up to let the dogs outside, I do all my other duties. The gate between the kitchen and the rest of the house had been knocked down though. It was honestly not really something that I had thought twice about. The dogs probably knocked it over themselves being bored or something. But two of the dogs were still in the kitchen though. The gate had fallen in a way that prevented them from easily getting out. The bulldog was missing though, which was a little weird because he couldn't easily get over the gate either, but... I figured he probably kicked it over behind him and wandered off to nap somewhere or something. But because of his age, he is definitely the least likely to make a mess or cause trouble, so I wasn't too worried. But I realized that that meant that I had to check the rest of the house for any accidents just to be safe. But first I, I get the other two outside. I was going to list the things that I have to do, feed the fish, refill the food and the water bowls, etc., when I get this kind of weird feeling. The bulldog is mostly blind, but he normally would have come wiggling to greet me, and all the noise I'd been making with the food would definitely have brought him over. So I started calling the dog and looking for him. I immediately heard him barking, but I couldn't find him anywhere. I looked at all of his favorite spots, but there was nothing. At this point... I was in full panic mode, mostly because I could hear the dog but just couldn't see him, so I felt like I was losing my mind or something. Finally, out of desperation, I started throwing open doors upstairs and I find him scared out of his wits shut in the guest bedroom. This made me feel really uneasy. My best friend's parents had been renovating the upstairs of their house, so the carpets were torn up and all the furniture was moved into storage. But they had shut all the doors before leaving to keep all the cats out of them because all of the tools and the stuff laying around them could have hurt them. So, how the hell did one of the dogs get one of the doors open and then manage to get shut inside too? I mean, the gate coming down, I had been totally willing to write off as accidental, but finding the dog shut inside of a bedroom that I had known had been closed off just made me feel really scared. So, I called my friend and told her what had happened, mostly to keep myself occupied while I'm still at the house. She told me that her parents had actually bought a really nice dog gate before they left, but had forgotten to unpack it, and that I could open it and set it up if I thought that that would help. So, I found the giant box by the front door, emptied it, and got to work. It took the better part of an hour to set up, but it was this really good quality pressure locked gate. It was made of metal, it came up to chest height, so probably around 4 feet tall I'd say, and takes two hands to open. But let me tell you, there was just no way that a dog could knock this down accidentally. Like I said, two hands are required to open it too. There are like two parts to the locking mechanism. You have to sort of um, hold this button down with one hand in order to slide the lock off with the other hand. So, content with a job well done, I left that night and went home to my own dogs. The next morning, I came back to find no issue. The gate had worked. But when I headed there after work that night, my heart dropped to my stomach. Somehow, the gate had been opened. Not knocked down as if the dogs had done it, but opened. And the rest of the gate was still in place between the door frame. I refused to believe that the dogs had somehow opened it. Again, the bulldog was missing too. And again, I found him shut in the same room upstairs. 
day three, I go back expecting more of the same stuff, and I'm practically prepared for it this time. But it just gets so much worse. So the kitchen and the dining room and the sunroom and the living room are all arranged in a sort of circle. From the living room, you head into the kitchen, and from the kitchen, you move into the dining room or the sunroom. And then from there, you can head through a door into the living room. However, the door between the living room and the sunroom is always locked. Not just closed, but actually locked. And to keep anyone from getting any funny ideas, they actually have a chair directly in front of the door, blocking it from opening. The reason they do this is because the way that the door swings open, if someone were to open it, the door would hit their expensive sound equipment for their TV. This door is not used regularly and has not been used since I met her. In fact, they had recently put a treadmill in the sunroom that totally blocks the door from being used. What I'm trying to say is that that's how infrequently this door is used. Anyway, I walk into the house that night and was greeted by the dogs. Okay, I guess the gate is opened again. Awesome. Except this time, the gate was opened. And so was the door to the living room. The armchair that blocks the door had been pushed out of the way too and the door itself was unlocked the key is left in the lock usually and the door was just flung wide open now while i do believe in the paranormal i am naturally a pretty massive skeptic i really don't believe any of the stories that i read online or any of the things that i see on tv but at this point i am terrified of my friend's parents house i know it hasn't been anything really bad but I just don't want to be alone when that weird stuff is going on. Even if the door was somehow just accidentally unlocked, unlikely mind you, but since I didn't personally check, who knows. I can't think of a, a rational explanation for how that chair moved. And I also don't have an explanation for the dog being shut in the one room. Especially the second time it happened when I know that I personally double checked the door and made sure that it was firmly shut. I love and respect the family a lot, but I don't know how to tell them that I can't pet sit for them anymore. I just don't want to be in that house alone anymore. Anyway, I finished the pet sitting many days ago, and I went back a handful of times with either my sister or my best friend, never alone, mind you. And at the times I went to check on the dogs with someone else, there was nothing weird but I am currently in the talks with them about setting up a camera, so I'll keep you updated if there's anything further. This happened a few years ago when I was around 20 or so, I'd say. I was hanging out with my buddy Matt at my apartment, located in the downtown area of a medium-sized Midwestern city. We were drinking whiskey, watching comedies, playing tunes, etc. He mentions that he has a close friend, Emily, who used to live in my apartment building with her mother, and she now apparently lives across the street from me, and he thought it would be a really good idea if we met because apparently we're very similar and I was single and ready to mingle at that point in my life, so why not? So he rings her cell and tells her to come by my place. She arrived at my apartment and I instantly became fond of her. She was hilarious, was very pretty, and a musician just like me. She was around 30, so 10 years older than me. My friend Matt was 35. I've always had friends that are much older for some reason, and we played songs together and laughed hysterically for hours. Matt decided to go home, leaving us two alone, and we chilled for a while longer, ended up making out, and got all of her contact info before she told me that she was going home and that we should meet up soon. Over the next few weeks, we develop a strong relationship and we hang out almost daily. I would throw some pajamas on and just walk across the street and we'd get wasted and watch movies together. Quite honestly, it was just really awesome. After arriving home from my 10-day trip to New York City, things got really weird though. The day that I returned, she asked if she could come over, so I unpacked all my stuff and then told her to stop by. She rings the buzzer, takes the elevator seven floors up to my apartment, and lets herself in. 
I was talking non-stop about all of the awesome things I did and the people I met in New York City and I could just immediately tell that she didn't want to hear any of it. She would change the subject every time I brought it up and eventually she just said, can you stop talking about New York? I really don't give a fuck. I was surprised to hear her speak like this. The Emily that I'd been getting to know was not like that. She was caring and passionate and just an amazing person. Or so I thought. Fast forward to a few nights later and I had just gotten home from working a 12 hour shift and I collapsed in bed ready to pass out for the night. It's about 9pm and I get a text from Emily that says, hey what's up? I don't feel much like replying at that moment because honestly I'm just too exhausted and our last hangout was just too weird for me to comprehend so I'm still trying to decide how to deal with that. So, I plug my phone into charge and turn off the lights and just fall asleep pretty effortlessly. But then, I wake up to somebody pounding on my door and screaming at the top of their lungs. Open the fucking door. Let me in now. My entire apartment reeks like cigarette smoke and I grab my phone from beside my bed, my heart beating a million miles per hour, 27 missed phone calls, a bunch of text messages, all from Emily and... I scan through the text while she's still at the door screaming, trying to break down my door. The most recent text from her is a long one claiming that I'm a piece of shit for not responding to her text earlier and that she's coming over to beat the shit out of me for not doing so. She had a key to the building still from when she used to live there. So I get out of bed, nearly having a panic attack and try to decide what my next move should be. Should I open the door to calm her down? Should I call the police? Should I just ignore her? I decide to open the door though and she begins wailing on me, swinging her arms, trying to hit me. She was smoking a cigarette and there were three cigarette butts on the ground next to her. Smoking indoors was prohibited in my apartment building. She was very obviously on some sort of drug though. She just kept screaming at me, telling me how awful I am for not responding to her text messages, slurring her speech and losing her balance. I was somehow able to calm her down and I took her to the roof of the apartment building which had a pretty nice enclosed picnic table area. We sat beside one another and she was quiet now, finally. She kept asking me how I could be such an asshole and that I need to explain myself. And the look in her eyes was just pure evil as she spoke to me in this calm demeanor. I said to her, Emily, I don't ever want to speak to you again after tonight. This whole scenario is absolutely insane. You need help. Let me walk you home. I take her home and I return to my apartment to attempt sleeping again, at which I don't succeed this time. A couple of days later, I return home from work and there's an envelope taped to my door. I open it and it's a handwritten letter from Emily apologizing and saying that I'm a beautiful human who doesn't deserve an evil person like her in their life. There was a, a candy bar attached to the envelope too. One that I'd never heard of that she always told me that I needed to try. I never spoke to her again after this but from what Matt tells me, which by the way, he always knew that she was a problematic person. She's a heavy user of crack now and is working as a food runner in a restaurant nearby. Needless to say, I did not try that candy bar. I worked at a local government agency for a long time. Each summer, we would get a new crop of interns too. Most of them were fine, but some caused issues like when we caught two of them actually making out in the file room. But overall, they were just normal kids from high school or college just trying to get some work experience. In 2016, my department received an intern later than usual though, right in the middle of the summer. Warner was a, a bit older than the usual crowd, around my age in fact, maybe late 20s. We initially hit it off pretty well and although I found him sort of strange, I didn't mind since he was friendly and we had some common interests. He was the only person in my department who was even close to my age too, so that was kind of nice. But the interns were all teenagers and the regular staff averaged around 60, older than my mum. So I was pretty psyched to have a peer to chat with. 
so occasionally I would eat lunch with Warner or stop to talk in his cubicle and whatnot. His strangeness was mostly uh, an outsized personality, a mix of over-the-top enthusiasm with a bit of social awkwardness. I got zero bad vibes from the guy, if I'm being honest. But it wasn't long before Warner started having uh, major performance problems at work. He would produce little to no work on most days, no show or arrive late without informing anyone, and generally just acted unprofessionally. One day, he showed up for work at 3.15pm when our workday ended at 430 the office manager was livid and told him to just go home. His behavior bothered nearly everyone in my office too, but I didn't supervise him and we had plenty of slacker interns in the past. While his antics were a bit of a spectacle, it wasn't a big deal to me. Now, if you're wondering why he wasn't let go, two words, political favor. I found out from Warner himself that he was hired because his uncle donated to the campaign of our big boss. In other words, he wasn't going anywhere. And near the end of that summer though, I put in my notice that I was leaving my job and relocating to a new state. But once Warner caught wind of this, he would constantly complain that it sucked that I was leaving because we barely had time to become friends. I would always laugh lightly in response and give him a sympathetic yeah but he would start to monopolize my time at work more and more, and it became disruptive to the people who sat near me, in fact. I found it slightly annoying, but I also was extremely happy to be leaving that job for reasons unrelated to Warner, and I spent my last month there not caring much about my co-workers and what they thought, so I tolerated him lingering by my desk. One day, though, he caught me leaving work and offered me a ride home. I usually took the bus and occasionally other co-workers would offer me rides home if they were going my way, so this didn't seem odd to me. I accepted and walked to his car with him. And man, it smelled awful and was just full of garbage. He hastily cleared off the passenger seat and apologized and we got on our way. But once we were on the main road, he started begging me to stop and get dinner with him. I laughed and said that he didn't need to ask me that insistently and said that we could stop at a diner on the way. We had a nice meal with pleasant conversation and he was intelligent and had a variety of interests. Our political positions aligned and we shared disdain for our cranky old co-workers. Quite honestly, I had a good time. I expressed too that he didn't need to drive me all the way home now that it was getting late but he kept insisting, so I just relented in the end. As I directed him toward my house, he started in again with the whining about how our developing friendship was cut short because I was moving. At this point, I was tired of hearing this. The decision to leave my job and move away from home was extremely difficult to make anyway, and I was proud of how bold I was being. I stopped responding and laughing, and his whining faded out. We came up to the turn to get onto my street and when I pointed it out, he accelerated and drove right past it, laughing. <laughs> I laughed in a what the hell are you doing kind of way, thinking that he was just joking around. When I began giving directions about how to turn around and get back, he started begging me to keep hanging out with him because he was lonely. But this immediately set me on high alert. It suddenly hit me that... I'm in a man's car, someone that I don't know that well, who doesn't exercise proper behavior at work, which is the only context I know him. And now he's displaying really weird behavior outside of work as well. My instinct was to not insist I be let out of his car. I felt as if this would escalate the situation into something negative and in hindsight it may have been the right thing to do when I think about the type of person he turned out to be. So I told him that we could hang out at the park near my house if he wanted to talk sometime. He seemed to like that idea and we parked and walked over. The pleasant conversations resumed and beside the weird clinginess, he was perfectly fine to talk to. Until he dumped his entire life story on me. Including his prior arrest for theft, his heroin addiction and related struggles with depression. I tried to be sympathetic, but I was very put off by this. 
it was a, a lot of highly personal information all at once, and I was still on alert because of his prior behavior, mind you. I tried changing the subject by showing him pics of my dog. I scrolled one pic too far, and the next one was a photo of me wearing makeup and posing cutely, way differently than the slob I was at work. He grabbed the phone and went, wow, you're very photogenic. I felt awkward and didn't say anything. There was a long silence and then he launched into a, a weird tangent about how compatible we are and that we have similar interests, etc, etc, and that he wishes I wasn't moving so that we could try hanging out again, but on a date this time. I didn't say anything and he broke the silence with, sorry I'm saying all of this stuff, I'm actually high right now. That's why I know where Riverside, a bad neighborhood that had previously come up in conversation, is and I went there yesterday to buy, otherwise I wouldn't have said it and I'm really sorry. Internally, I freaked out at this. He had definitely put his drug addiction in the past tense and I assumed that it was something he was recovering from, not currently using. I also realized that I had been in a car that he was operating while he was under the influence. I don't know anything about heroin so I was pretty clueless but I felt very, very stupid at this point. He immediately started whining and begging me not to judge him or hate him and just kept saying over and over again how nice I am and how understanding I am that I'm pretty and smart. All of these weird compliments interspersed with a talking down about himself. I didn't know what to do so I just smiled reassuringly and told him not to worry but that I was tired and I needed to go home. And that's when he started crying. He had this really weird wheezy sob too, but no tears were coming out. I sat there silently while he did this, trying to come up with some sort of a graceful escape plan. But my patience was wearing thin at this point and my anxiety was through the roof. It's a weird feeling to be annoyed and panicky at the same time, so... I stood up and apologized, said the park was close to my house so I'll walk and started to leave when I remembered that I left all of my stuff in his car. Trying a new approach, I casually mentioned that I forgot my stuff in his car and joked that if he wanted my dirty lunch containers he could keep them. He ceased his bizarre crying and stood up and ran over to his car to unlock it and I grabbed my stuff out of the back seat. His demeanor changed drastically as he calmly apologized for making things weird and asked if he could drop me off at home so I didn't have to walk alone at night. I said yes in the end but made him drop me off a, a block over from my little side street so that he wouldn't see which house was mine. Now I could end it there but what bothered me the most about this guy happened after this encounter and I'll try to make this part short. So a week or two after that weird evening and the end of August by this point... I had my last day at the job and moved a thousand miles across the country. Warner would sometimes text me with uh, long ramblings detailing his feelings about himself and about our missed opportunity and I didn't respond to these messages. But now that I wasn't near him, I didn't feel the need to placate. The text stopped after a few weeks and quite honestly, I just forgot about him. Fast forward to February and I get a text from a former co-worker. Her message said, sorry you had to hear about it this way, and her text message was a link to a local news article titled, Man Dies from Wounds in Riverside Stabbing on Wednesday. Because of the way she worded it, I thought Warner was the victim, but when I read the article, it included his mugshot and the charges. Apparently, he was the attacker and he actually murdered someone. I felt so shocked and disgusted that I couldn't believe I knew someone who killed another human. But later on, I called an old co-worker for some details. Apparently, shortly after I left the job, he was fired for trashing the men's bathroom. Like, just threw around anything that he could lift and poured all the soap out and smeared it all over the place. He then apparently lost his apartment too. Presumably, some of the articles about the stabbing describe Warner as a, a homeless man. I have to assume that that's how he ended up in the aforementioned Riverside. There are a lot of homeless drug addicts who squat in abandoned houses there. 
At the time, I wondered if the man he'd stabbed had refused to give him something that he wanted, and that is how he reacted to a hard no. I don't think I made all the wisest decisions during my interactions with Warner, but man, I'm glad I was able to avoid setting him off like that, since he was clearly not stable at all. Hands down, that was the worst intern I ever encountered. So this was about three years ago on a dark stretch of road near a main intersection in a, a major Bay Area city. I worked at a big name, a healthy grocery store from 2014 to 2017. I was lucky to meet and work with amazing co-workers, some of whom have become my best and closest friends in fact. One of my best friends uh, at the time and to this day, Cav, is one of the nicest, most caring people that I've ever met. He's incredibly generous, genuine and warm and welcoming to just about everyone, sometimes to a fault in fact. At the time of this story, I'm a woman in my early 20s and Cav is a guy in his late 20s. Cav and I had a, a weekly ritual of driving around the city after work and just talking, sometimes about our problems, sometimes about what was going well, but it was therapeutic and always something to look forward to. This particular night, we invited our buddy Ben to join us. His department always got out 30 to 45 minutes after the rest of the store, so Cav and I decided that we should do a short drive around the area to just pass the time until Ben was off. Cav was driving that night too. So we did our drive and I headed back to the store to pick up Ben. In order to get back to the store too, we need to make a U-turn at a four-way intersection. But to get to the intersection, we have to go down a, a dark but short stretch of road. There are no street lights for some reason. I don't know why. The intersection is well lit though and is always busy and has a shopping center and plazas on each side. From the dark section of the road, it's exactly 302 feet, according to Google Maps, to the main well lit and ever busy intersection. So, as we're driving down the dark section, Cav suddenly interrupts what I was saying and says, Oh shit, did you see that person waving? He slows down the car as I look back. No, what are you talking about? I say. He says, you didn't see them? There was someone in a black hoodie waving us down. I'm looking back and I have poor eyesight. It's dark, so no, I don't see anyone. There's no one there. As I'm saying this though, Cav is pulling into the empty parking lot parallel to the dark stretch of road. He reaches to the back seat and is moving jackets and other stuff off the seat, obviously making room for this person. I said to Cav, no, no one is getting in this car, do you understand? But he then says, if they need someone. But I interrupt and say, no, there's no one there and even if there was, they could walk up to the fucking intersection, so no. He eventually agrees but insists that we continue to circle around and check. I reluctantly agree, but realize that I have no choice anyway. So, we circle back and, sure enough, there is a girl, my age, in her early 20s, just standing alone wearing all black. She has a hoodie on. She looks disheveled and is sort of crying, maybe? The cab rolls down the passenger window, my window, about halfway, to which I roll it back up another quarter of the way and asks her if she's okay. She seems off to me and I immediately have these awful vibes from her. She says with her hands over her face that four guys saw my purse. It had my wallet and I literally lost everything and I don't have a phone. But the weirdest thing about this is that she wasn't actually crying. She was stretching her words out and kind of whining, but she wasn't crying. I said, okay, well, we'll call the police for you. Why don't you walk up to the well-lit plaza at the main intersection and we'll wait with you for the police. She adamantly says, no, it won't help. I already called the police an hour ago. And this is when I started to freak out. She just said that she didn't have a phone and that she's standing in the dark for an hour. I said to her, I thought you don't have a phone. And she said, I do, but it's just dead. 
All of this was happening rapid fire and before I can really mentally get into what is going on, Cav tells her to get into the car so that we can help her. I say, walk up to the plaza to the intersection and we'll help you. But Cav unlocks the door and says, no, don't worry, we'll drive you there. The girl has her hands in her front pocket of her hoodie and gets into the car. And at this point, I am pissed. Absolutely fuming, in fact. The girl is acting super weird, and I remember at this point that I have my box cutter on me. I reach down into my backpack and am rummaging through my crap to find it. Cav is talking to her, but everything she says is contradictory. She says that she isn't from this area, has no idea where she is, yet she tells us that she grew up and lives about six blocks away. As we're driving, she says that she wants to go to a particular bar that she could actually use a drink. I said to her, I thought you don't have your wallet or ID. I keep looking for my box cutter and am looking back at her. She has a, a waxy complexion and looks into my eyes as if she's looking through me. And it gives me the fucking creeps. Cav is incredibly kind to her. Idiot and keep saying positive things, trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. While this is happening, I find my box cutter, open it all the way and hold it in my lap. I turn back and keep my eyes on her. She tells us that she actually has a boyfriend nearby eventually and asks for us to take her there. She and Cav continue to talk and she says that she was kicked out of her parents' house. Her hands still remain in her pocket and mine remains holding the box cutter all this time. Because of this whole ordeal, we've totally forgotten about Ben at this point. Still watching her, I pull my phone out and call him. I'm explaining to Ben what's happening and in a matter of seconds, she went from asking us for money and alcohol and just saying weird shit to just wanting to get out of the car. We didn't stop her at her boyfriend's house but a few streets away, apparently in a, a random neighborhood. We drop her off and... There's silence for a few seconds in the car. And then Cav says, Oh shit, she could have robbed us or killed us. Yeah, thanks you fucking idiot. Anyway, I'm 100% certain that, at the very least, she was planning to rob us. Looking back on this, there's so much that I would have done differently, like calling the cops right away. We were lucky that nothing happened, but I'm positive that... That there was evil in that car that night. For a bit of context, I grew up in the middle of a farmland in a large 1800s Victorian home. Given its history, there has always been several shacks and barns that once belonged to the builder of this house. There's a highway that sees about uh, maybe three cars on it during the night. Directly across from said highway, about 200 feet inward of a cornfield, is a shack that I've always found creepy. As kids, myself and friends would dare each other to go inside and look, which always ended up with us going as a team. Nothing scary was ever found, but it was always a bit of fun. Maybe a few broken glasses, metal piles of miscellaneous items. There was no electricity or any sort of utility that made it homely, though. So, years go by and the existence of the shack becomes uh, just a part of my daily life. However, one particular night, as I was watching TV, I noticed a light going off and on outside of my window. After initially getting a little bit startled, I just dismissed it as passing cars, simply more frequent than they typically are. An hour passes and it's nearing midnight and the light stays on. But this time... I know for sure that it's coming from outside. My family was asleep, but being my pansy 16-year-old self, I needed confirmation. But too bad for me that no one wants to go out and check it out, so I end up going alone. I grab my pocket knife and flashlight. It was the best that I can think of with my shaken thoughts, and I take off into the night. As I need the highway, the lights turn off, almost making me choke on air, but... I had to figure out what the hell was going on in there. I eventually make it to the entrance of the shack, which has no door, and slowly begin to enter, my flashlight scanning the room for any sign of life. 
And what happened next, I'll never forget. Five feet away from me, there's an old tattered recliner facing away that my father had tossed in there for future disposal. I shine my light on it because I knew I'd seen it rock ever so slightly. And as I did that, a man stands up from the recliner saying absolutely nothing. And all I could tell was that he was middle-aged and wearing a jacket of sorts. Before I could even process what was happening, I was already sprinting across the road and praying that he wasn't behind me. It felt like years before I made it back to my door, but as I'm about to make it into safety, I decide to look back and he was standing on the road, completely still, and no words whatsoever. It's been seven years since then and the shack still stands, the recliner remains in place and my dad never believed me. I wish someone could share the dread that I had when I realized that the recliner was facing a window which was directed straight at my house. So this happened while I was still living in St. Louis and I've since moved to Chicago. 2016 was a, a wild year for me, full of coming out of my shell and self-discovery. I found myself becoming a more comfortable with using applications such as Grindr and Scruff to meet men online because I had social anxiety and had trouble meeting them elsewhere. But one night, I got a message from a seemingly average dude. He was very nice, super funny, was able to hold a conversation and he was also not that bad looking so I was intrigued and kept the conversation going. But there were virtually no red flags about him and I ended up exchanging numbers with him too. We get to texting and after a week or so of solid conversation, we decide to meet up at a local cafe. I put on my best damn shirt, clean underwear and I hit the road and I'm excited. I was busy during the day so we plan to meet at a local cafe around 8pm. He doesn't live in the city like I do so he was unfamiliar with the area. When we met, I was immediately enamored with this guy too. He was cute, he made me laugh and surprise... He was who his photographs actually said he was. Nothing was strange about this guy and he was just a cutie pie. And I was digging him and by the feel of things, he was digging me too. <laughs> what a twist, right? Anyway, at one point during the night, we were sharing memes with each other over the table. I show him one of the funniest that I have in my photos and he nonchalantly grabs my phone from me to take a closer look. He started swiping on my phone for a minute and at this point, I didn't think anything of it because I just assumed he was looking at the other memes I have saved. No big deal. He gave me back my phone and then proceeded to show me some memes on his phone this time. A man who has a folder of saved memes on his phone is a true godsend, let me tell you. Anyway, the night goes on and the cafe is closing so we decided to leave. As we're walking out together, he asks if I wanted to still hang out. I didn't feel comfortable letting him know where I lived just yet, so we just drove around the city listening to music and talking and whatnot. Just stuff like that. It was again just pretty normal and we were just laughing and joking around, but at one point in the night, he turns to me at a red light and asks, Do your roommates know you're on a date right now? I laughed at this and just said, No, why? Are you going to kill me? I've honestly just read way too many things online and that was my immediate reaction. He lightly just said, I would use them as an emergency backup if I were you. You're probably right. I shot back and we just continued with the night. It was nearing midnight and I had a lot of laundry to do the next day so I mentioned that we should probably just head home soon. He offered to drop me off at my house but I didn't want him to know where I lived just yet like I said so... I asked if he could just drop me off at the train instead, and he politely agreed. When I got home that night, I was totally thrilled with how things turned out. He was a total sweetheart, and I was really into him. So, I opened up our conversation to shoot him a text message when I noticed at the bottom of our conversation was a notification that said, you started sharing your location today at this time. I thought it was a little odd since I never used that feature, but... I thought maybe I did it by accident or something and just turned it off. 
I sent him a follow-up text message saying that I had a really great time and would love to meet up with him again. But he didn't respond to this. I just assumed that he was busy and started browsing Reddit like the senseless fuck I am. I woke up the next morning and prepared to do my chores, washing my bed sheets, buying groceries, going to therapy. The grocery store was my last stop and as I was ringing up all of my necessities, guess who was also in the self-checkout? It was the guy. Wow, imagine that. He immediately comes over and strikes up a conversation with me and I thought it was odd as he previously mentioned that he doesn't live in the city and isn't very familiar with it, but the conversation was harmless, so I just kind of let it slide. A few weeks go by and, unfortunately, the conversations begin to dwindle and we start talking less and less. But quite honestly, I'm used to this happening, I guess, so I just let it happen without pushing for answers. And eventually, we just stop talking altogether. One night... I'm home alone just sitting down watching cartoons when there's a knock at the door. It was late so I didn't feel comfortable answering so I just sat there for a moment hoping that they'd just go away. They knocked again and more urgently this time. I peeked through the peephole and I made out two figures and my heart immediately dropped as I recognized one of them in a hoodie or hat combo. He had an extremely defined jaw so... I was able to immediately recognize him. Well, I literally freaked the hell out and called one of my roommates to come home and that it was urgent. But when Andrew came home, he told me that he didn't see anybody near the apartment complex, so I calmed down a bit and explained the situation. It was also during this calming down period that I realized that he found out where I lived by my location sharing that he turned on while we were at the cafe. I didn't immediately turn it off when I got home, so he had plenty of time to figure out my coordinates, especially if he was watching the map immediately after he dropped me off at the train station. He never did show up again after this particular occurrence, and I never heard from him again either. I also noticed that our conversations disappeared from Grinder when I last checked, so I assumed that he must have blocked me. I still have no idea what he was planning to do, but... I assume that he was just going to rob me, but it's completely possible that it could have been something worse. So, this all happened when I was in 8th grade. I lived down the street from my friends Dylan and Emon, and we used to hang out every single day after school, and after a while, we got into Ouija boards and such. We didn't have a real one, but we printed one offline and made a makeshift one using a hoop earring. We would play with it daily for about two months too, or longer even, in Dylan's basement in the laundry room. To clarify, Dylan's basement and laundry room, it had no windows. Dylan was a musical kid and he had a xylophone in his basement down there to play. I remember he actually told me how to play He Comes the Sun on it too. So... This particular day, we went into the basement and I played that tune on the xylophone because I thought I was hot shit doing so. I then laid the mallets down flat across the xylophone and we proceeded into the laundry room to play with the Ouija board. Backtracking a little bit though, we had played with it for a couple of months regularly at this point like I mentioned. We had also become acquainted with uh, some sort of spirit by this point as well. He hated talking about how he died and in fact just wouldn't do it and was apparently enamored with me. But the earring moved so quickly and on its own too, a lot, so I was already pretty convinced, but of course, I wanted more. So, this one day, the last time the guys would play with it, I had asked the spirit for a sign. Yes, I know that that's dangerous and kind of against the rules, but the spirit agrees and I asked what we needed to pay attention to, and it told me the door hanging on the doorknob was a tie and we waited for about five minutes and then the tie fluttered back and forth for a second. The guys were stunned because there was no passage of air anywhere within the basement, let alone the laundry room and I however thought that it was pretty much nothing and certainly not enough to convince me. So I ended up asking for another sign. Again, I know, stupid. When I asked though, 
the spirit obliged. I again asked what I needed to pay attention to and he told me to listen. We sat there for about another 5-10 to ten minutes with pretty much nothing happening. And then, all of a sudden, we hear one loud ring of a singular xylophone key play out. We walk out of the laundry room and we find both the xylophone mallets are wedged in between the xylophone keys just standing straight up. Nothing happened after this since the guys wouldn't play anymore and honestly, I never got it to work in my house. But anyway... I hope you enjoyed the story. So, uh, I... I don't know how to begin this, but... I decided to share this to get some help because... I'm just afraid to ask anyone I know personally. I'm 24 years old. A roughneck working up in the northern Minnesota logging area. Among other work too. Recently, or yesterday in fact, due to our bow hunting season opening, I've been spending my time out in the woods. I live on a fairly large plot of land near Eli, Minnesota. There are a few towns over the population of 2,500 this far north, and neighbours are far and few in between. The terrain is really unforgiving compared to the rest of Minnesota too, and this ties into my story. So, here's what happened. I began by climbing into my non-permanent stand about uh, two and a half to three miles from my house in the state forest adjacent to my property. It was opening morning and all was on par. The sun was barely creeping out when I looked off into the woodlands and spotted something really odd. It was a, a white-tailed deer, perhaps 40 yards away too. The woods up there are so thick that I could only see the body and the neck and that's what really confused me the most. It was sickly grey, with pieces of dried matted fur clinging to its bony physique. It looked like a piece of roadkill just standing there. I pulled on my backpack that was hanging off to my left for binoculars to get a closer look, and at this time, I had the urge to look back. For some reason, I felt the back of my head vibrate, like little vibrations or something. I felt a cold sweat work its way across my body and I looked back and I saw the deer now turn towards me. It was taller than a usual deer too but physically looked inept if that makes sense. Now I also saw its head and antlers too and worst of all though was its eyes. Its eyes even from the distance that I could see were just milky white completely off hue from the usual brown or black of deer. Its head was really disproportionate too, favoring its left side with a bulging jaw. The antlers were just really unusual too. Instead of the fresh new transition from velvet to antler, it was a, a muddy green with an almost pus-colored flavor to it. I don't know how to explain the feeling that came over me too. I mean, I've been through things that I can't explain. I've seen people that I care about die me meters away from me. But... This, this is the sole time that I felt truly afraid. I was making eye contact for maybe a minute maximum, blinked and then this thing was just gone. As if I almost imagined it or something. I still had the overwhelming urge to run too, which eventually I did and I noticed as soon as I made it down with all my gear that the usual sounds of the forest, they just weren't there. There were no birds, no squeaking of squirrels, not even so much as wind. I mean, the whole forest was just dead silent and still. This all happened yesterday morning and today I just refused to leave the house regardless of it being my imagination or whatever it could have been. I couldn't sleep whatsoever and I just had the odd feeling of being watched all night. Any help is appreciated because... I need some answers. So, uh, it's the next night now, about 9pm I'd say, and I went through the regular chores and fed the animals on my small hobby farm. As it began to get darker, I got a, a shiver and that weird sense of being watched again. I tried letting the dogs out so that they can run and use the bathroom, but both my large pit lab mix and German shepherd, they just refused to go outside. 
every time I tried to call them out, they just run off to the other side of the house. I can't help but think that something is actually going on here. I'm not trying to be controversial or start a debate or anything, but I know my wits, myself, and this area. The lady friend is coming over tonight and she wants to talk about it too. Again, I'd just really love everyone's opinion if that would be okay. So, I had a good talk with the girlfriend overnight last night, and I've finally been able to relax a bit. I went to bed thinking things had a, a logical answer to it, and that I may have just been overreacting. I slept throughout the night, and I'm at work at the moment just updating. Unfortunately though, not all was as perfect as I thought it was. My girlfriend is staying with the dogs until I get home, and sometime after I left, she woke up to hear banging and something going wild outside near the chicken coop. As she walked out once the sun came up, something decently sized got into the coop and just killed every last chicken. I originally thought a fox, but she said that every single chicken was accounted for. None were eaten, they were just killed. I thought that maybe one of the dogs got out, but... She was adamant that they were inside our room with her. Funny thing is, I have made sure that the coop was practically impenetrable by foxes or predators. But it looks as if the door was either left open or something unlocked it. This is my story about my close encounter with death and the unknown one fateful night. Let me preface this by saying that Azusa seems to be a hotspot for paranormal activity and witchcraft. There has also been a handful of Bigfoot sightings there too. So, this is the first time that I've shared this story with someone as well and it all happened fairly recently. Just a couple of months ago in fact. I was driving with my buddies up the mountain road that led to our favourite reservoir to fish. It was about 11pm and there was zero activity on the road and the night was pretty silent too. Usually, I can hear the crickets and the owls with the occasional coyote calls, but not tonight. I couldn't tell if this was a good or a bad thing, but I must admit that I did feel uneasy for some reason. I mentioned this to my buddy too, who I'll call Bob for now, and Bob said that he was also feeling a little on edge for some reason too. But luckily... He had his carry permit and his 45, so we ignored this tension that's building up and park at the turnoff that leads to the hiking trail. It's about a two mile walk to our spot from the turnoff into thick trees and bush. Our trail is well established and the moon is full, so we didn't have a hard time getting to our spot. But the whole time though, it was just complete radio silence. Except for the sounds of leaves and twigs crushing beneath our feet and being echoed throughout the reservoir. So, our fishing spot is on the side of a mountain with trees to our left, right, and behind us with the reservoir in front of us and not much space to move. This is relevant to the story because everything went as usual up until about 2.30 in the morning. By this point, we had caught five bass between the two of us and were just itching for another bite. And me and Bob were both very silent and focused on feeling the next bite. And that's when we heard a slow and low creaking sound from up the mountain behind us. We looked at each other but shrugged it off, but the sound grew louder and louder until it climaxed with a loud snap. Just as we turned, a large tree about 400 yards behind us and up the mountain begins to fall and slide down the steep mountainside. Along with it, brought some big loose rocks tumbling down too. We start reeling up as fast as we can and run back to the trail to our right and wait for everything to just fall right into the water. The tree got caught on another group of trees about 50 yards from us and a lot of rocks made it down into the water that we were just fishing in. And holy shit, we could have just fucking died is what we both said. We were pumped full of adrenaline just trying to cool down too. So we sat on a rock next to the trail and just breathed for a bit. And that's when we heard a loud and bellowing howl that sounded like nothing I've ever heard or probably ever will hear again. If I had to describe it, it sounded like a, a depressed middle-aged man letting out all his pain in one long howl, with the force of a, a lion's roar though. 
In fact, I could feel the vibration in my chest as it let out this chilling cry. And it just felt like it would never end. But when it did, however, it was followed by the sound of something pushing through the trees and brush, walking deeper into the mountains. Needless to say, we got the fuck out of there in record time. Once we got into the car... We felt safe in our modern steel machine, so we lit up on a dab rig to celebrate being alive and making it back another night. Well, we did make light of the situation at the time. It was definitely because if we had taken a hard look at what had happened, we would have just shit ourselves. Myself and Bob later came to the conclusion that we might have been around a Sasquatch that had broken a tree to mark its territory or something, and we just happened to have been there. We still fish there to this day, and plenty goes on in Azusa Canyon, from ghosts to Bigfoot and everyday horrors like murder and rape and god-awful stuff. Nowhere is safe, but we'd rather be in nature enjoying ourselves than in the city, and at least we get to pick up poison, right? Back when I was 16... I'm nearly 27 now. I briefly dated a guy named Tyler for what was maybe almost five months, I think. We broke up when my mum's job moved us uh, almost three states away. We were young and I didn't want to maintain a long-distance relationship while I was trying to adjust to moving from what had been my home of 10 years and starting a new school and all that. We actually stayed casual friends until a mutual told me that... He'd actually begun spreading gross rumors that he'd popped my cherry before I left, and after I called to confront him about it, he even admitted to it. I told him that I never wanted anything to do with him again and blocked him on Facebook and his number from my phone and all that, and that quite honestly, I didn't even spare him a second thought until three years later. So, I just moved into my first apartment with my boyfriend of two years and two of our friends. I had a job I loved, a great relationship with our roommates, and it was an ideal arrangement for all of us, really. But one night, I opened my Yahoo account, though, for the first time in a little over a year from my desktop, rather than my phone app. And immediately, I had an instant message from Tyler. I had forgotten that back when I used the desktop version frequently, my settings had me automatically logged into the messenger, and I hadn't removed him from my contacts and all that. By now, we were both nearly 21 and I had done a lot of growing up, so I assumed Tyler probably had to and was initially comfortable catching up with him. He'd always been a, a bit awkward, but I was too and the conversation was fairly pleasant. Just the usual how have you beens and whatnot, with me doing most of the talking since in comparison, I'd had more opportunities granted to me where I live now compared to my and Tyler's hometown where he still lives. Eventually, we signed off since I had worked the next day, and while I wouldn't have considered us friends again, I was happy it was civil. But then, he started getting uh, just weird. Eventually, I added him on Facebook, and he would just randomly send me messages about going through my pictures and liking how much I had grown up and what a woman I'd become. At first, I brushed it off as awkward flattery, but... Then he started talking about the things he wanted to do to me, the sexual things, and I firmly reminded him that I had a serious boyfriend now and how inappropriate his comments were. He would apologize, only to do it all over again the next day, and I got sick of it and blocked him again and told him on Yahoo that if he didn't stop, I'd be contacting the authorities. It was a bluff meant to hopefully scare him. It worked for a few hours before he decided to send a message detailing the violent sexual things that he wanted to do to me again. At this point, I was beyond annoyed and disgusted, so I told him that if he ever contacted me again, I would send the screenshots of everything that he'd said to his very Christian mother, who was graciously letting him live rent-free with her. I blocked him on my Yahoo account after that and never heard from him again, assuming that he was just now out of my life. And oh, how I wish that was the end of it. So fast forward a few years, I'm 25, happily married, and my husband and I have just returned to the States after living in Japan for a few years due to his military career. 
Shortly after we got settled in at our new place, I took a trip to my hometown to spend time with my family and catch up with a few friends. Over coffee, a long-time mutual friend of mine and Tyler's, Amber, divulged to me that Tyler had been cyberstalking me. Okay, I thought, but that's not really anything serious, right? I mean, I had nothing to hide from anyone, and I was blissfully happy and all, but she started going into detail. So, I had moved three times to two different states and then to Japan since I had last spoken to Tyler, and was now living in a, a third new state, and Amber said that each time I moved, Tyler would suddenly just talk about wanting to attend university and whatever city that I'd moved to. And when I moved to Japan, he claimed to be saving up to vacation there, specifically the area that we were stationed in rather than a place in Tokyo or Okinawa or the other big tourist cities. It was weird to be sure, and Amber told me that she knew Tyler was stalking my Facebook under a fake name. He uh, apparently openly admitted to her, but he would never tell her the name that he used. She was really concerned about his behavior and even admitted that she was only in touch with him because of it. In truth, apparently, he'd become infamous in our circle of mutual friends for just being a creep and sexually harassing several women, successfully chasing all of them off. I felt really uncomfortable with this knowledge too. If her timeline of things were true, then he'd been keeping up with my movements for nearly six years now. But what could I do about it? Neither of us knew what name he was using, and if all he was doing was following when and where I moved, I didn't think that there was any harm to it beyond just creeping me out, since he was very unlikely to be able to afford to travel to wherever I was at the time anyway. So, I went home and just eventually forgot what Amber had told me, since there really wasn't anything I could do about it anyway. I wasn't receiving any harassing emails or texts, so it was just out of sight, out of mind, right? Months passed and I went to work as usual and life went on. I was a hostess at an upscale local restaurant and one night a co-worker, a fellow hostess named Gina said, Oh hey, uh, you had a friend stop by here yesterday. A friend? I'd moved here nearly a year ago by now but the only friends that I had were my co-workers. When I asked her who, assuming it was just a, a regular that I was friendly with or something, I felt my heart stop when she replied, Tyler. I asked if she was sure and she vaguely described his appearance, assuring me that she told him that I was off that day and she didn't know when I would work next. Hiding my panic, I claimed to not know anyone named Tyler and that maybe he was looking for a previous employee. My first name is actually really common and I just excused myself to the bathroom. Sure enough, there was a message from Amber when I opened my phone. She'd apparently come home from work to see a Facebook post, which she screenshot and sent to me, about a friend of hers and Tyler's visiting the city next to where I lived, which is a huge tourist attraction, and Tyler had gone with him. The restaurant I currently worked for only had maybe seven locations scattered in various areas surrounding the tourism hub each with a company name and an add-on depending on the specific location in town to make them easy to find. But the co-workers I was friends with would tag me as checked in with them on Facebook when we would have drinks together after work and whatnot, and it seemed that Tyler had used them to find out which one I worked at. Terrified now, I spoke to my manager and told him everything that Amber had told me and that Tyler had apparently showed up looking for me, and blessedly, he let me have the following day off. I still had to finish my shift though, we had no one available who could cover for me to go home but he gave me tasks that would keep me away from working the front door and since it was a slow night, Gina let me go home first after I'd filled her in on the situation and all. I immediately called my husband when I clocked out too and he picked me up rather than letting me walk home like I usually did. Thankfully, my husband had recently decided to switch military branches and would have to go to training for a few months and we decided that it would be better for both of us if I moved to his hometown to be near our family. I gave my job my two weeks notice the next day, much sooner than planned mind you, but my manager already knew that I was moving away and understood that I probably wanted to quit now rather than later given all the situation. It's been seven months since then and I'm happily living near my mother-in-law, 
literally on the opposite side of the country from my hometown and our last location, an ever close-knit little group of friends in our apartment complex, but I did a complete overhaul of my Facebook settings. No one can tag me in any location or picture without my manual approval now, and my current location is unlisted to anyone not in my friend list. Amber still has Tyler on her Facebook, but she says that they rarely speak anymore after he was recently served with a restraining order by a mutual friend of ours. In other words, it seems like I wasn't the only person that he was stalking, and I'm not surprised given the stories of him that had been floating around our old circle of friends for quite some time. I must admit that I still get a little anxious every now and then, especially when I remember how close Tyler came to finding me, but I still don't understand why he's kept track of me for so long, and to be quite honest, I don't think I ever want to know. This story takes place years ago, around 2008 or 2009 I think. I was about 14 years old and going through a, a, just a really hard time with my parents and a hard time with early teen years as a whole. I had a room in the basement where I stayed cooped up most of the time and I had my own computer too. Around this time, Facebook and MSN Messenger chat rooms were pretty popular and honestly, I don't remember how I started speaking to this guy but I ended up connecting with a man who told me that he was 35 but that he knew that I was mature enough to know the truth and have adult conversations with. He, uh, he played with my head a lot and this only came out after days of chatting too. We continued to chat more and more often too and he complimented me and made me feel like I was the most amazing person ever. And this escalated to personal details being shared and eventually webcam chats. Now that I'm in my mid-twenties, looking back at 14-year-old me, I cannot understand why an adult his age would take such an interest. I was just a kid, plain and simple. But he slowly became lovey, if that's the right word, and would call me pet names and start flirting and all that. Every so often, he would back away and claim that it was wrong, but I would fight and convince him that I was mature for my age and no one needs to know and blah blah blah. I see now that this was his tactic. He had no intention of just letting me be. In fact, the scheduled webcam times became typical and steady. He made me trust him and he made me want him and crave his presence. He made me feel better when I was in a turbulent time in my life and he turned me against my family too, one small step at a time. And eventually, we began saying a uh, I love you to each other and he wanted to buy me some plane tickets to save me from my parents as he could take care of me better than they ever could. He told me stories of how things would be, how I could go live in Mexico with him and learn to speak Spanish. All of these just wonderful things and no one has to know. He could arrange the whole thing and I just need to be sneaky about it. My heart honestly pounds as I remember how close I came to doing it too. I... Honest to God, nearly did. I don't remember exactly how this all ended, but I believe I invited a friend over to webcam with him or something, and she just flipped out about it all. At the time, it seemed so great that I just so happened to fall onto someone so caring and wonderful. I mean, heck, he would have flown me to a tropical paradise straight into his loving arms, right? And I needed love, but now I just get chills thinking of what would have happened. I mean, what kind of adult flirts with a child? Makes these sort of plans with a child? I can't even imagine what his plans were and if he ended up moving on to someone else. So I'm 18 years old and I currently live in Egypt. I'm half Egyptian and I moved here about two years ago. So... I don't really know how to deal with uh, people in here. And by people, I mean troublemakers. The place I live in is pretty decent. and I actually go to a private school, so I never have to encounter any troublemakers, really. My dad travels a lot, and since I'm the oldest of my siblings, I do most of the shopping, so I always get the groceries and almost everything from big malls. But one day, my hour-long trip just turned into a complete nightmare. 
so I drive a pretty good car. Not a sports car or supercar or anything, but uh, a pretty uh, a good car for an average youngster in the Middle East. It's an SUV. And about three weeks ago, I had a list of groceries to grab, so I went to the mall and did the shopping and paid for it, and I just got out of there. I also decided to try that new vegan burger that I see every day on Facebook and got one burger, soda, fries and walked to the parking lot. As I did this, I saw this kid who I thought was maybe 15-ish and he actually looked pretty homeless to me so I decided to give him my fries just to help out and all that. So I dropped the bags on the back seat and I was even thinking of talking to him maybe to hear his story or something. I was just really urged to help him after seeing him like that and I go over to him and shake his hand and I ask him what he's doing out here and he said that he was on the way to my village but lost all of his money. Now a lot of people have warned me about this scam but I felt like he was actually in a really bad situation so I asked a few more questions like where does he live, is he in school, what are you doing in the city, I was out of the compound that I lived in at the time and he said that he was working with someone and he sells stuff on the street and he sold the goods but he lost his money. I actually felt really horrible for him so I offered him a ride to the bus station and enough money to get him there. It wasn't much but it'd be enough for a ticket and maybe a little bit of change. It was almost on my way anyway, only two turns away. I didn't feel anxious at all at that point and I actually told him a bit about my private life. Not really just what I do but where I live and all that. Before I head out of the mall though, the security comes and asks me if he's causing any trouble and I said no, that he was alright. At the time, I actually thought it was pretty disgusting for him to assume that this poor guy was a bad person. But anyway, we head out and I shared my burger with him and even gave him the soda and he starts guiding me through the road and it was all fine until he asked me to take a turn to a dirt road. Now, I don't really know where the bus station is but... I knew for sure that it wasn't there. I said that I'll just check it on my phone and he said alright and that it's just a short route away and that's when I started questioning his story in my head. I was relieved that he didn't insist on anything but still I was certain that a public bus station would be more public and he wouldn't be able to do anything right? So I was still safe. What made me really suspicious though was the phone call that he made eventually where he called someone and said something like, Hey X, meet me at the one below the bridge, I got the goods. Now, I was like what the hell is he talking about? I don't see any goods. Before we arrive, I said sorry it's dark and you can walk there and I'll drop you on the road right across and he said yeah that's alright. I sighed at this and was a little bit relieved, but, but then he called the guy again and told him that I'll be out on the road and I'm in a white SUV and at that point I began to get really anxious. So we arrive and holy shit, what happened next was not cool. There, right on the road, I see probably seven guys who were obviously looking for me. Now, it was on a highway, so I thought switching lanes at the last minute would be okay. But as I began to get closer and look around, I also see another huge group of people on the other side. I even noticed that one of them had something that looked like a stick. They spot me and they start waving and shouting and he says, yes, you can drop me here. And I say, hell no. I took the middle lane and gassed away and they were shouting and running after me and I look at him and say that if he doesn't want me to drop him here that I can only stop at the police station which was the complete other way and he says that that's okay that I can drop him here. I said okay but make it fast and he gets out but then puts his hand on the handle to try and keep the door open. I change the gear and I just take a sharp turn to his side and I adjusted the wheel and just sped the fuck out of there as he let go. I don't know what would have happened if they had caught me that day, if I was going to be mugged or maybe it was some sort of drug dealer shit. I don't know what the hell was going on, but the whole thing was just so sketchy. So in October, 
It will be about three years since I came alarmingly close to a real life horror movie. So, I took my now ex to the Mahitian cabins in Ohio for our one year anniversary. It was beautiful weather and we were staying in a decked out treehouse in the middle of the woods. I read great reviews about the place and decided it would be a perfect little getaway for us. We spent the first day just hanging out at the treehouse mostly. We watched movies, sat on the balcony and did some exploring through the trails and whatnot. I was feeling very content and looking forward to visiting the town the next day too and the next day we went to a, a few little shops and restaurants and decided that that night we could go to a bar and watch the baseball since we didn't have cable at the treehouse. I kind of had a bit of a cold at the time but figured that I'd just stick it out and drink a few beers with my boyfriend so that he could watch his favorite team play. We got to the small bar around 8 or so and immediately we just didn't feel very welcome. The bartender was sitting with a group of local guys and it was clear that they all knew each other and they were pretty tight. This didn't stop my ex and his ego though. He walked right up to them and just started ordering drinks for us. He would also get up and make the dudes high five him every time that something good happened in the baseball game. I tried to escape his uh, cringe-worthy social attempts by downing a few blue moons. But to my luck, or so I thought... The bartender kept bringing me beers and telling me to just help myself. I cut him off pretty quick. Uh, I'm a lightweight and already wasn't feeling so good anyway. A few more guys came into the bar and my ex started telling one of them how we weren't from around there. And we were staying in the tree houses in the Mohitian woods. But suddenly though, I really started feeling dizzy and just really unwell. I don't know if it was from the cold or from the overwhelming amount of drinks in front of me or something else but I was ready to go at that point. Also the bar was starting to empty anyway and I didn't like the vibe I was getting from the people around us. But once we went outside to the car and started driving we noticed though that something just wasn't right. My ex parked in the Taco Bell across the street from the bar and saw that our tires had been slashed. Well he starts getting pissed at this point and I'm barely half awake too and he tells me that he's going back to the bar to see if anyone has a tire iron he can use since his is bent and just won't work. So leaving drunk me in the car he goes back in to find just one man sitting at one of the tables. Before my ex says anything the man creepily says to him a little birdie told me that you have a flat tire. Creeped out by this but wanting to just get the hell out of there. My ex asks if the dude has a tire iron that he can use to replace at least one tire. The guy says that he has one at his apartment right around the corner and has my ex follow him there. When we got to this guy's apartment, suddenly he became aware that this just wasn't feeling right. This guy's apartment was just full of those big plastic barrels used to store hazardous waste and there were just stacks of paper and boxes just everywhere. The creepy dude is taking his good old time too and saying that he just needs to look a few places for the tire iron. Finally though, it clicks in my ex's head that he was lured away from the car that I was now sleeping in. He tells the creep to forget the tire iron and just runs back to the car and he turns the car on and drives back to our place on basically his rims going as fast as he can. But there are no street lights mind you basically no one else around too and we're driving at like 3am up a dark road hoping the car makes it. Once we get back we realize that some of these creepy people there know where we're staying now and it could easily find us too. Needless to say we stayed up through the night with a hatchet next to us and the first thing we did in the morning is we called to have our tires changed and we just got the fuck out of there. I don't know what would have happened if my ex hadn't have reached the car sooner but my mind is telling me that these guys planned to keep him away from me as long as they could for god knows what reason. Also I don't know why the hell this guy's apartment was filled with these just plastic drums but it was creepy. I also want to mention that everyone else we met in that town was super nice and welcoming and don't let this story discourage you from checking the place out if you want to. On the other hand, those creepy locals from the corner bar, I sure hope that you never run into them like we did.
True crime was and is one of my favorite genres of entertainment. I love reading about serial killers and stalkers and things like that because none of it had ever touched my life personally. But since this happened, it's become much less rooted in fantasy and I'm now looking out for red flags everywhere. So, during my sophomore year in college, I was a volunteer teaching assistant for an on-campus international student program in the Northeast. Basically, it was the last step students had to take to get a certificate telling potential schools and employers that I can speak English really well and here's proof. The students tended to come in groups selected by programs in their home countries. So, one semester we might have a lot of Chinese and Brazilian students and the next we'd have Koreans and Saudi Arabians and this particular semester there were a lot of people from Mexico and they all lived in an off-campus housing complex called The Suites. Now, my position, as I've said, was just as a volunteer. I'd had some friends from the program in the past and they knew I wanted to teach English abroad so they put in a good word for me with the staff so that I could get some practical skills and experience under my belt and all that. Being an informal arrangement as it was, I had no qualms about forming personal relationships with the students. In fact, a few of us are still good friends today. I wasn't a very outgoing person at the time and though I had many friends, I hardly ever drank and I've never really been to a party per se. Hearing this, the Mexican students who threw parties just about every weekend insisted that I come to the next one. I have to admit that the party, it was really fun. It was comprised of, almost exclusively, international students which was nice because I actually knew most of them. I actually got really drunk too and had fluent conversations in languages that I had very loose grasps on. And everything was just going great, until a few of us retreated into a friend's dorm for some air. Checking their phones, a few girls realized that Pamela had not returned from Main Street yet and no one could get a hold of her. Pamela was a 19 year old Mexican student and had gone to a local eatery after lessons that day in order to meet one of the teachers for a private tutoring session. But the session was scheduled for 5 p.m. and should not have gone longer than 7.30 and it was 11.30 at this point and the girls were understandably worried. I asked which teacher the tutoring session was with and they told me that it was Charles and immediately my skin crawled. There were about five teachers at the facility and Charles was by far the sketchiest. He was around 40 years old, half Japanese American, with short but visibly flat iron black hair that partially covered his glasses. He honestly just looked like a stereotypical weirdo. So I tried to hop around between classrooms on a weekly basis to get a feel for different teaching methods but I cut my week with Charles short because he was just uh, so creepy. The way that he spoke to his students was condescending and mildly inappropriate. The commenting on a girl's blouse or telling risque stories about his own wild college years and how they ought to take a page from his book. All of this in the middle of class, mind you. Additionally, he would always get uncomfortably close to the Latina students, grabbing their shoulders, touching the smalls of their backs and even gazing at their breasts occasionally. Honestly, he'd never done anything too bad, but he just creeped me and everyone else the fuck out. And so, after sharing some creepy Charles stories, we were all pretty freaked out and ready to do something. The last anyone had heard from Pam was at 5.15 when she texted and said that her phone was going to die, but she would figure out a way home when the tutoring session was over. It was the middle of winter in the northeastern US and a blizzard warning was in effect too. The dinner she was at was a three mile walk from the suites and a few girls suggested that she was bunkering down until the warning let up. The problem was, that could be days. Another theory was that she got lost trying to find her way home in the snow. None of us had a car so we told a few of the boys and they formed a search party and started walking toward Main Street. But just a few minutes later, they returned with a snow covered Pamela in their midst. Being from Mexico, none of these people had properly packed for a brutal winter, so when they found her, she was absolutely freezing and soaked to the bone. So, after a hot shower and relaxing for a bit, 
as she told us in Spanish what had happened. But when she arrived at the diner, the Charles was nowhere to be found. She waited 40 minutes and was about to start walking back, knowing a storm was coming, when he finally showed up. He apologized and said that he was just upstairs and had dozed off. He lived in the upstairs apartment, you see, and asked if she would mind taking the lesson up there as it was a lot more quiet. Being a, a shy and somewhat reserved person who spoke little English, she just complied. When upstairs, he started asking all sorts of questions about herself. Most she could barely answer and when she stumbled, he would laugh and chastise her for her mistakes. He tutored her for about an hour and then made them both dinner too. It was 7pm by now and Pam wanted to leave but he told her to eat and that he would drive her home afterward. It was pitch black mind you and the storm was picking up considerably at this point. He told her that a girl like you shouldn't be walking home alone at night. Pam was nervous but she knew that he was right too and she wasn't confident that she'd even be able to find her way home in all this snow. So, she stayed. When they finished eating, Pamela went for the door, but he stopped her and asked if she would do him a favor. He went into his bedroom and beckoned for her to follow, and hesitant as she was, she peeked into the room and saw a full photo studio set up against the wall facing the bed. He told her to stand in front of the light so that he could take a few photos and then he'd take her home. Frightened and confused in a country that she was very unfamiliar with, with a man that she thought she could trust, she did as she was told and after a few minutes, the request got darker though. He showed her pictures of other girls, mostly college age Latinas, who he had taken pictures of in various positions and states of undress and asked her if she would do some of these poses too. She said no, that she didn't want to undress, so he pulled a pair of boxer shorts and a tank top out of his top drawer and tossed them at her. He said, put these on then, just a few pictures and then we'll go, I promise. So she went into the bathroom to change into the clothes that he'd given her and she just sat there, cursing at her phone and on the brink of tears. For 5 and 10 and then 15 minutes, she couldn't remember how long she sat there until she just heard knocking on the door. He said, Pamela, come on, I was just kidding. Come out of there and I'll take you home now. Not completely trusting him, but knowing that there was no other way out of this situation, she exited the bathroom. He apologized for making her feel uncomfortable and offered to drive her home, at which point she grabbed her things and said that she was fine walking and just left. He didn't go after her too and he didn't try to stop her she did in fact end up getting lost too and walked around town for over an hour before the boys found her a few blocks from the complex. We urged her to tell this story to the police but they said technically that no crime was committed so she told the head of the program. Interestingly enough he accepted it a little too easy as if he expected it and we later found out that this was apparently not the first time something like this had happened. We already knew it wasn't because he had pictures of other girls too, but an especially ugly story found its way to us. So apparently, the previous year, a South American girl was really struggling in class and received tutoring from Charles. After two or three sessions, she just stopped going despite her grades not improving. She became exceedingly closed off too and just stopped going out altogether, often missing class. After a few weeks, she just dropped out of the program and flew back home. No one knew her well enough to ask why, but they all had a sneaking suspicion that it was because of Charles. And after hearing Pamela's experience, the program just immediately dropped Charles as a teacher, which just proves that this was not the first complaint against him. This last bit may also just be a rumor, but I heard from a pretty solid source that after Pamela filed the complaint, the police checked him out and Charles apparently wasn't even his real name. Turns out he'd been using fake information to get teaching gigs around the country for the past five to ten years as he was actually a registered sex offender. He's probably in jail right now but I'm not too sure because after this Charles just disappeared.
So firstly, I'm going to tell you guys about the story of what happened to me, and then after that, I'll explain the info that I found out later that revealed all the creepy stuff. So, this was in 2005, and I was living in Missoula, Montana. I was 10 years old, my 7 year old sister and I shared a bed and my best friend was also over this night having a sleepover. We were all in my big bed which was up against a window and if you looked out the window you would be at eye level with the ground. In front of you would be just the backyard and up and to the left you would see the deck that went up to the stairs level and led to the kitchen. Anyways, this night in like February or March I think, it was still cold and kind of snowy. The three of us were having a giggly sleepover in our bed and I looked out the window for a split second and I saw a deer on the deck. I showed my sister and friend and we didn't think much of it but about an hour passed and we were finally ready to go to sleep and I looked out again and saw the deer still on the deck. But this time it had two green lights or iridescent looking things. I pointed it out to my sister and friend and they saw it too and all of a sudden it moved and it was very clearly not a deer. It was definitely a person but all we could see was the silhouette and it looked like they were facing our, our kitchen door window or something. We kept watching the person and all of a sudden they started moving towards the deck stairs toward us. He got to the bottom of the stairs and stopped probably looking at us and just stood there for a few seconds. He must have been six feet away from the window and it freaked us out and we all started screaming and he clearly heard us and just ran out of our backyard. My dad, he actually went out with his gun and called the cops and there was nothing. And so that was the experience. But here's the context. I didn't know this because I was young and my parents didn't say anything at the time, but during this time, all the neighbors got a notice from the local PD saying that they had information leading them to believe that a wanted killer and child molester was in the neighborhood, or at least in the area, and just to keep an eye out. I believe later that they actually released the name of this individual to be Joseph Duncan. It was like uh, the talk of the town for sure for a long time. My parents didn't tell us this explicitly, but during this time, we weren't allowed outside alone and we weren't allowed to go to the park down the street and all that stuff. So, about a month and a half later too, in Idaho, a little girl named Shasta and her brother Dylan were kidnapped and their entire family inside the house was killed with a hammer by a man named Joseph E. Duncan. What's crazy is that he actually snuck into their home in the middle of the night after scouting at their home once or twice. And he could have very well done the same to my family that night or possibly another night. He did just horrible and unspeakable things to the children and eventually killed the little boy too. He tortured that poor little girl until they were found in a Denny's. And my dad and I actually watched the report moments after it happened in a, a hotel room on vacation. My family was all over this because we totally believed that that man was the one at our house that night. But one more kicker. So apparently he used night vision goggles to scope out houses of potential victims. And what did I see on that deer? Green iridescent lights or the reflections of the night vision goggles. I am totally convinced that that night when I saw the deer, that I actually saw Joseph E. Duncan getting ready to take his next victims, us. To start off, this happened in high school around 2014 or 2015 I'd say. I was in 10th grade and my friends and I thought it would be funny looking back on my life this is probably one of the dumbest things I've done though to get a Ouija board and just mess around with it it was a bad idea I know and it was also very typical of a bunch of stupid 15 year olds who were just beginning to learn about witchcraft and all that anyway I did a little research if that's what you want to call it I just looked up to the do's and don'ts but we bought a Ouija board from Target honestly this story gets more stereotypical as we go and we messed around with it in my friend, we'll call her M, M's backyard. 
All I can say is, thank God that we didn't do it in the house. At first, only Em and I used the Ouija board, and for the most part, we were just kind of fucking around, just trying to spook each other, but I was genuinely curious after a while, and we started to try and use it properly. We talked to a few spirits, nothing bad happened, and we thought that it was pretty cool. About a week later, Em told me that she got her own Ouija board. It was from someone's yard sale or something, and me being the only one of our friends from our friend group who bothered to actually look up Ouija board experience online, my reaction was kind of like, uh, this isn't good. I was a little concerned that something might be attached to it because I had read about not using a Ouija board with a previous owner, but eventually we got bored at her house and went outside to use it. Our friend also came over, I'll address her by the name of E, and... She had never used a Ouija board before, so I told her the big no-nos of using a Ouija board and we got started. We were also on Skype with another one of our friends because he wanted to watch us use it. And immediately after a few yes and no questions, my friend got the hang of it and we asked for the spirit's name. And it spelled out M-A-M-A. And E immediately noped the fuck out of there because... She had read some dumb legend online about the demon that goes by that name. She took her hands off and honestly, I could have strangled her right there and then because I knew that she had broken a rule by doing that. I know that you really don't know who you're communicating with with the Ouija board, but I wasn't too scared yet, but she had definitely broken a rule and I thought it was sketchy to kind of keep going at this point. In fact, I was about to say goodbye with them and... Immediately, the planchette moved in a, an infinity sign around the board. My stomach dropped and I felt some sort of weird tingling or presence, if that's the right word, which is the first time that I had ever felt anything like that. We had to force the planchette to say goodbye because whatever the fuck that was didn't want to say goodbye, and I threw the planchette out into the yard. At this point, we had forgotten all about the Skype call and my phone was even off at this point. But it was fully charged and when I turned it back on, a friend told me that it had actually disconnected and made a bunch of weird noises. And that, that kind of spooked me out a bit. I told Em and E that we were going to get rid of the fucking thing and Em got very irrationally angry and looking back on it... I didn't think much of it because she has a few mental illnesses as it is and I figured that that was probably it, but now I kind of think maybe it was something else. Em and I fought over the board. I wanted it gone and she wanted to keep using it. And he snatched it from Em and said, I'm getting rid of it. Look what it's doing to you guys. And we kind of calmed down a bit after this. She tore it up. It was a cardboard one and walked to the river behind Em's place and just threw it in and all three of us vowed to not touch one ever again. So fast forward to a few months later after Christmas break and I went to Em's house to sleep over for the weekend and she brought out this big ass wooden Ouija board. Her brother had gotten her another one dated back to the 1950s because he thought it was really cool and knew that she was into that stuff. You know that legend that says if you don't get rid of a board properly that it comes back? Well, yeah. It seemed like it came back alright. And ten times worse this time, too. I refused to even touch that board because I knew it was a bad idea and I did not want to feel the feeling that I got from the last time we used it. I just got this feeling that's hard to explain and I knew that I shouldn't touch it. But my instincts proved me right in the end, too, and reluctantly... I went outside with her and this was the first time that she had used it because she wanted me to use it with her but I still refused and I told her that I would watch but she couldn't pay me money to touch the damn thing. But my instincts were just screaming at me that this was just all going to go wrong and of course it did. So immediately the board spelt out M-A-M-A. -A. I tried to tell M to stop using it but it was like she didn't even hear me, and it scared me even more this time because my hands weren't on it. It was all her, and she was so focused on it, almost like she was in some sort of a trance or something. 
after a few yes or no questions and me becoming more on edge by the second. Her hand on the planchette started moving around faster and then I couldn't keep up with it and Em just looked up and said she wants me to leave her an offering. I ripped her hands off from the board at this point and I told her that that was enough and that that was a terrible idea and she snapped out of whatever had her glued to that board and said, yeah, you're probably right. We went back upstairs and put the Ouija board in their closet and Em went downstairs to grab a snack when I was using the bathroom and when I came out of the bathroom, she was sitting on her bed with the Ouija board again and her hands were moving like they were before. And... At that point, I got that really strange feeling again. She just looked up at me like everything was normal too and I took the board from her again and tried to talk some fucking sense into her and I shut it in the closet and left the light in the closet on. I turned on all the lights in her room because at that point, I have to admit that I was absolutely terrified. But things died down until my friend who had literally no idea about the Ouija board, texted me with some screenshots of M threatening to sacrifice him for the blood moon. I asked M about this because it was just totally weird and just so out of character for her. And She picked up her phone and looked through the text she'd sent and she looked up at me with genuine fear in her eyes. Some small part of myself still wanted to think that this was all her just fucking with me or something rational sounding, but the look on her face confirmed it. Something was just very wrong. And then, we heard a thud in the closet. We immediately looked towards the closet and we could see something moving in there from the shadow on the floor. And then, the light on the closet just went off. The switch was on the outside and the switch was still on though. Em was terrified and so was I. The lights in her room were flickering and we looked at each other to confirm that we had both just seen that. At this point, it was around midnight and things just began to get worse too. She tried to go to sleep but there was no way that I was going to get any sleep that night. She slept for maybe 15 minutes and woke up because she said that her leg hurt. And we looked at her leg and there was this huge claw looking mark there. We heard something banging around on the roof too and the house just made these awful noises. And the whole time I, I just had this feeling that I still can't explain to this day. It was the dreadful feeling like before but just way worse. I genuinely thought that I was going to die that night in fact. Especially after we saw something move in the corner of the room. Em eventually got so tired that she fell asleep leaving me to deal with the noises that sounded straight out of a fucking horror movie. But the worst part was probably that feeling. It was just so odd and it felt so disturbing and I really thought that I was going to die that night. Strangely enough though, Em eventually woke up in the morning with just absolutely no recollection of that night's events. And apparently, she had a, a dream about a, a spirit leaving her body. And that was all she remembered. To this day, I firmly believe that something was happening that night. And something was trying to get my friend. And whatever it was, was either something demonic or just something extremely negative. I'll never forget the feeling that I had that night too. Not for the rest of my life. And it just honestly shook my beliefs to the core. And yes, we threw the Ouija board into the river that morning. But... The strange things happened in her house for a long time after that whole incident. At the time of this story, it was the summer after junior year and a couple of my buddies and I were at someone's house doing the usual things teenagers do. After a couple of hours of Xbox and basketball, one of my friends Sam rolled up with a trunk full of fireworks and we decided that it would be fun to go set them off at an empty field a mile away from the house. As we all piled into Sam's car and started driving out of the neighborhood, a man stepped onto the road and blocked our way. He was huge too and covered in tats, probably 6'3 or so I'd say, with a long dark hair pulled back in a ratty ponytail. Sam honked the horn as the man just stood in front of our car yelling obscenities at us. When finally, my friend has had enough and whipped the car around him while flipping the guy the bird, speeding out of the neighborhood and towards the main road. 
a couple of minutes later and we got to the field and set up the fireworks. As we all hid around the edges of the grass, Sam stepped forward and lit the firework up. Seconds later, the firework ignited and exploded, much louder than any of us had expected in fact. It was so loud in fact that I ran back to Sam's car with him and he slammed on the gas and flew out of the parking lot onto the main road. As we neared the entrance to my friend's neighborhood, it dawned on Sam that he had left the rest of the guys back at the field, so he stopped the car and made me get out so that he could go retrieve the other guys. I didn't understand why I couldn't go with him, but it didn't matter. It was a nice summer night anyway, and I sat down on the sidewalk near the entrance of the neighborhood and just pulled out my phone. After a couple of minutes of phone games, it died on my hands, and I thought, shit. And... I just sat back and enjoyed the weather, waiting for the headlights to come back down the road when I heard a slight noise behind me. I turned my head expecting to see a bird or windblown branches or something, but the streetlight outlined the figure of a, of a man. The man from earlier, in fact. He had crept up behind me while I was sitting there and he locked eyes with me and I was immediately struck by the wild look in them. Like, he was both looking at me and looking through me at the same time or something. I got up and backed away slowly, and then turned and started walking away from him. He kept pace with me though, and began to yell at me, Hey you, get the fuck back here. I increased my pace, and he continued to match it, screaming at me the entire way, and eventually, I was full out sprinting away from him, and I heard him slow down. I tore down the sidewalk back to the parking lot of the field and was reunited with my friends before relaying the story to them as well. As we drove back, we searched the area for him but he was nowhere to be found. It dawned on me though that if my phone hadn't have died, I probably would not have noticed the footsteps of the man and probably would have not had such a fortunate outcome in the end. I don't know what his problem was or, or what he was going to try to do to me if he actually got a hold of me but... Man, am I glad that my phone died that night. So my husband, Kid, and I, we live out in the middle of nowhere on a plot of land that's about uh, 100 acres, I'd say. There's probably about uh, 95 of those acres that are wilderness with just ATV and hiking trails that we and several of the other previous owners created by exploring. We use that land for camping and hiking and hunting and we like to find a spot, just clear it a bit and camp overnight with not much else with us. But there's so much space that we've never stayed in the same place twice in fact. We've seen some kill sites, both old and fresh, lots of animal tracks, places where deer bed down, etc. And I've even spent a lot of time hiking solo while the kids are in school and husbands at work and whatnot. But whether alone or with family, but we always carry a firearm for protection though. A few weeks ago, we decided to load up on some camping gear and start a new trail. We marked the trails that we make with spray paint on trees. We were pretty far in the woods, having hiked almost an hour now, when the atmosphere just seemed to change. I don't know who noticed it at first, but my husband, who was leading the three of us, turned around and gave me a, a concerned look. The birds had stopped chirping at this point and the insects, they had gone quiet. There were just absolutely no sounds around us at all. And when in the woods, complete quietness is rarely a good thing. We continued onward though, hyper aware of our surroundings while our kids continued merely talking. We came to the stream that marks the midway point of our property and we stopped for a few minutes. And my husband and I, we just kind of stare each other down. We both just felt like something was off, but didn't want to scare our daughter. Eventually, I finally broke the silence and said, I suddenly didn't feel good and we should just go home. My husband nodded in agreement while our daughter voiced her protest, but too bad, kiddo. We turned around and we started back. After going a few hundred yards, still in the silent wilderness, mind you, I looked to my right and I saw a, a person crouched down in a ghillie suit about 150 feet off the trail. I'm positive that they saw that I noticed them too, but they never moved. I cleared my throat to get my husband's attention and when he looked back, 
I put my hand on the gun in my holster on my hip, which caused him to readjust his rifle in preparation of anything. I sped up my family and we hurried back home and I told my husband as soon as we were inside. We decided to call the police and report the trespasser and filed a report and was told to call again if we saw anyone. A few days later, my husband and I went out alone and set up a bunch of deer cams. We didn't go back out into the woods for maybe a week and then he and I ventured out to retrieve the cam footage. Out of the nine cams that we placed... We caught a person in a ghillie suit in two images. We handed copies over to the cops to go with our reports, and we haven't gone back out since except to check the deer cams. We haven't gotten any other trespassers pretty much ever, and it freaks me out even more to think of the few times while camping that we actually heard walking near our tent in the middle of the night. We always assumed that it was just curious animals, but now... I'm not so sure anymore. So, before I tell this, I think I need to give some quick background info that seems relatively important to the story. So, it's 2003 and I'm six years old. At the time, I lived in a small condo, with one bedroom, one bath and a connected living room and kitchen with an island in between and a spiral staircase with random miscellaneous things stored under it. I was living with my dad with a mother who was out of the picture. It was Saturday and I remember specifically watching Codename Kids Next Door on TV in the bedroom after waking up. My dad, he worked a lot of the time but he was such a nice guy that he left the TV on Cartoon Network for me which he knew was my favourite channel. During a commercial break, I got up to take a piss and even though I knew I was home alone, I closed the door out of instinct. And boy, am I glad about that. The next thing that I comprehended was the sound of my incredibly noisy spiral stairs. They can be heard literally across the condo because of how small it is. And they just began to rapidly make noise that got quieter over the course of about two seconds. And telling me that whatever made the noise was going downstairs and fast. As a six-year-old, this was extremely concerning because, as I said, my dad always turned the TV on before he left for work and I knew that he was long gone at this point. So, what did I do? Well, as any paranoid six-year-old would do when they think that they've imagined it, I walked out of the bathroom and looked over the three foot long railing across from the bathroom door and next to where you would walk down the stairs. Kind of confusing I know but just try to visual it I guess if you want. And what did I see? None other than an afraid looking man looking into my living room but staying hidden under the stairs. After being terrified in the bathroom I made a distinct effort to be quiet like a spy I was thinking. So there was no way that he knew that I was looking at him, but more than likely, practically guaranteed in fact, knew that I was in the house somewhere. Okay, so there is a man in the house and I can A, yell at him to leave and maybe be murdered, raped or beaten or something. By the way, there was no exit upstairs, only a balcony with a screen door that was jammed for years and... Even if I somehow got it unstuck, it's like a a 15 foot drop that would be no good anyway, so the only exit in the house is the front door. It's a fire hazard, I know. Or there was option B, hide. (laughs) I opted for option B, obviously. I waited for what felt like hours, but in reality was probably only about 20 minutes until I heard shuffling downstairs for about a minute. Then, the sound that I was praying for, the front door opening. I was still extremely skeptical, even thinking that it was a trap to lure me downstairs, so I stayed put upstairs. All day, in view of the TV by the way, until my dad came home, who I didn't tell about the whole incident, out of fear that I shouldn't have had, thinking that he would be mad that I didn't approach him or something. Nothing valuable was missing from the house, but... You're sure as hell that I checked under those stairs every morning when I walked down them for the next three and a half years of living in that condo. So, why was he there? I have no idea. How was he there? 
I have a pretty reasonable theory that, simply put, my dad forgot to lock the door behind him after he left and this man was trying doors for some reason and he came in and hid upstairs somewhere to do something but got cold feet because I was a little kid. But other than that, I have no idea. All I can say is that, man, am I glad that I had that bathroom door shut because if he had seen me directly, who knows what could have happened. Back in 2013, I was living with my ex at the time who lived near a nice country village and as I was in between jobs at the time, I picked up a job at a local garden center. It was casual retail work, fairly decent pay and easy going enough that I could take a coffee break frequently and wear basically whatever I liked as long as I wore my work polo shirt. It was walking distance from my ex's house and full of people of all ages who were the most lovely people that I've ever met. Most of the regular customers who came to the garden center, they were usually sweet old people who would visit the cafe because we had free tea and discounted lunches for the OAPs if they had a store card. So, you often got to know all of them and some of them we even gave nicknames. Most of them were pretty sweet, like Pink Hair Lady. She was a badass 80 year old grandma who wore a tasseled leather jacket and bright pink hair. But then there was camper van couple who used to drive a really cool camper van with bright orange flowers painted on it. You get the idea. But with Creepy Artist Man though, he gave most of the young girls there weird vibes. He wore a, a straw hat, was in his late 40s I'd say, had round gold rimmed glasses and would wear strange graphic shirts with naked women on them or a processional pussy patrol sort of slogans on the back and stuff. He always wore ripped jeans where his knees were always hanging out of them, which were always dirty and painted or mud or something. He had this weird half smile too that would never leave his face and kind of a leer that made people feel uncomfortable. He would take off his glasses and clean them constantly which kind of made you feel like he was trying to get a better look at the girls who worked there or something. Especially the younger ones, uh, 16 plus school leavers usually. Anyway, it was a roasting hot summer's day and I had gratefully accepted the job of watering the hanging baskets outside where I could avoid the humid sweaty heat of the greenhouses. I was wearing black shorts and my red polo and my tool belt to prune and deadhead the plants as I went. With the hose in my hand and sunnies on my face, I was busy but enjoying the solitary job at the quietest part of the garden center. And then I heard, well hello there, out of practically nowhere too. He slipped out behind some wooden trellises and looked me up and down, smiling with this weird two small teeth. His eyes lingered on me for what felt like an uncomfortable few seconds and I turned off my hose and asked him if he needed anything. He shook his head and kind of shrugged, still smirking at my legs too. I said to him, okay sir, have a nice day, let me know if you need anything and I turned to continue. He says, I've never seen you here before, you're a new one right? I say, huh, me? Well, I've been here for 8 months now. He says, I must have missed the memo that a beauty like you started here. You have a nice tan, you look young. I say, uh, thanks, I'm 23. Anyways, I have to go back to work. And he says, nice to meet you, and quotes my name. I suddenly remember my name badge and I get slightly irritated that he now knew my full name. I make a beeline for the smoking area where the tool shed was with an excuse to grab some smaller gardening gloves and by the time I returned to the floor, he had left, thankfully. As the weeks went by, he would come into the store regularly, usually mid-afternoon I'd say, but coincidentally or so I thought, around the time that I started my shift. Most of the time, I was the only cashier, so I would have to serve him. He would buy the most, just smallest pointless things like florist wire or a tiny bag of bird seed, and it seemed like he would purposely make a purchase with the intention of interacting with me. He would make comments about my appearance, statements mostly like, you have your hair different today, yesterday you had it down, you have new glasses, or that's a different lip color to yesterday. He would always announce my name loudly and deliberately during every interaction too and 
I felt really uncomfortable, but I was 23 and I kind of just politely shrugged it off at the time. Around Christmas time, I was decorating the artificial trees and he cornered me in the forest of them at the back of the store. He jumped out from behind one and he actually made me jump to which I was kind of pissed about him doing because I dropped a glass ornament and it had smashed. He bent down also and tried to help, grabbing my wrist and telling me not to touch the glass. His grip was actually scarily tight and forceful and his hands were clammy and gross too. I slipped my hand out of his grip and asked if I could help him with anything and that's when it got weird. He pulled out a leaflet from his back pocket and told me that he was an artist and had a Christmas art show happening in the local church hall and he wanted me to go with him. He told me that he was a painter and thought that I would like his work. I had never indicated that I was interested in art, to him or anyone else for that matter, which is why I thought it was strange. I asked him if he wanted to pin the leaflet to the local event board and he reached out and touched my arm and said no, that the invitation is specifically for you. He pointed his finger and jabbed it to my breast and then he said, you. So I'm standing there in a dark corner, obscured from view by artificial Christmas trees, just kind of cornered by this guy who was touching me at this point. I kind of just cringed away and said I was busy with my boyfriend that day sorry and kind of just scampered off at that point I remember feeling uh, really strange after that though the fact that he grabbed my wrist and jabbed his finger into my chest that way I told a few of my colleagues about it and they told me that they would warn me next time he was in the store so that I could maybe hang out in the storeroom until he was gone well, that memo must have been missed by a few of the temp Christmas staff because one day I get told by one, your friend is asking for you at the tills. It wasn't totally unusual for my friends to stop by as it was a fairly popular for gift store so thinking it was maybe my ex's mum or something, I head to the till and there he is and he's holding a piece of paper. I cringe but he had seen me now so... I walk over and ask what he needed from me. He passed the paper over and asked me to open it. Folded up was a drawing of me with exaggerated breasts and like cartoon-like eyes, watering with hanging baskets in a, a sexual kind of position. I kind of stood there and I said thank you out of just a knee-jerk response, but I couldn't keep it as I thought it was inappropriate to take gifts from customers and all. I handed it back to him and he kind of looked at me with this angry stare. He turned around and walked out just without another word. By this point, I had had enough to be honest and I knocked on my manager's door and told him about the whole scenario that had just happened and all the previous interactions that I'd had with him over the past year. He watched the CCTV and agreed that it was really strange that he gave me this gross picture and told me that he could talk to him if he came back. He praised me for my reaction to his advances and said that I was doing the right thing and he would try and see him off next time if there was a next time. So the next day was Sunday and I wasn't due to work. My boss calls me and tells me that he just received a call from HQ stating that uh, an anonymous caller had called in to report a staff member inappropriately coming on to a customer. The staff member that they described and named was me. The caller had said that I had been inappropriate towards him at work, offered to have sex with him, had led him on and obviously was promiscuous and that I had been pursuing him for over a year now. The jerk even described a fictitious relationship we had had and ranted loudly about how I'd been cheating on my boyfriend before hanging up. HQ luckily didn't believe a word as my manager had already mentioned the guy to one of the higher ups, but they thought it was wise to let me know about this crazy guy and suggest that I report it to the police at this point. The next day, I did just that. The officer I spoke to said that he actually matched the description of a man who was just a local pest, somebody who would often harass young girls in the local area and he was also known to stalk girls in his car and had even attempted to abduct a young girl four years ago. <laughs> Holy shit, right? 
the police officers assured me that they would file the report and talk to him officially and that he was not allowed in the garden center or anywhere near me again and if he did I was to call the police and he would actually be arrested. Unfortunately though it never stopped him sending a ranting letter to my workplace addressed to me saying that he was going to end himself if I didn't take him back and receive his gift that he drew of me. Fortunately the police saw this as unsolicited contact and he was thankfully arrested. I don't know where he is and whatever happened to him but the fact that he actually tried to abduct a young girl four years ago is creepy to say the least. My mother and father had been separated since I was about one or two years old I'd say. And I visited my father occasionally during the summers while I lived with my mother. But for some reason, my mum believed that it was a great idea to send me to my father's this summer. And this, despite at the time, he didn't even have an official place to stay because he had gotten kicked out of his home a few weeks after I'd gotten there. And so, he resorted to staying with a friend that he had met at a past homeless shelter, Pete. Now... Pete's home on the service looked decent and even though he seemed odd, nothing rang any real bells and he seemed pretty much okay. The first night that I knew something was wrong though is when I fell asleep in his bed. That night, I woke up with bed bug bites just all over me. I mean, they were just literally everywhere. When I first complained to my dad about the bites too, Pete was a bit upset and said... Uh, my bed don't got any bed bugs, you must have bought them in. And he was just in absolute denial at that point. Another side note, my dad left for work leaving me alone with Pete for 8 to 12 hours a day sometimes. After a few days of being there, I started to get more restless too because Pete would sometimes make suggestive comments toward me that he had sexual implications or would just refuse to let me eat anything until my dad came home. For many of those wondering why I didn't tell my dad was, well, because I assumed that if we didn't stay here that he would end up living on the streets and I'd rather deal with this asshole than live in a cardboard box, right? However, one day I was a bit more talkative than usual. Mind you, at this time I hadn't slept for around 21 hours and hadn't ate for half that time. I was exhausted but the bed bug bites constantly made me itchy and... I couldn't sleep and I just had to talk. I don't remember completely how it even got to this point, but all I can remember is that I was in the bathroom. So, at some stage, I think I possibly told Pete that I was just fed up with him and would tell my dad. And as I closed the door behind me, he suddenly came charging in like a bull. I tried locking the door, but he wouldn't let me close it. A 12-year-old versus a grown man... I didn't stand a chance strength wise. Now my mum constantly trained and drilled into my head that adults they can be dangerous that you should never get into someone's car and in her own words if they got you in the car play along and then grab the steering wheel and try and crash the car. It's better to die than have them get you to the second location. And no matter what even if you have to risk your life never let them get power or take you into that second location. I remember going into instinct mode and I grabbed the razor that he left on his sink and Pete was screaming things like I'll kill you and just other shit like that mixed in with just swear words. I remember I stupidly dropped my phone near the toilet but opened the door and slipped beneath Pete's arms. I sprinted for the door and he caught me and slammed me into the wall. I remember slicing his arm with a razor when he tried to strangle me and getting up and just running outside of his house. He was unable to catch me at that point and then I made another stupid mistake. Some old guy beneath our floor kind of knew my dad and offered me to stay at his house and wait for him to get home. Guys, I know that this was dumb to accept but I was tired and hungry and just wasn't thinking straight. When he had made me a sandwich and gave me a blanket to sleep on his couch, I was thinking what if he poisoned this food or was going to try and rape me when I fell asleep or something. Imagine, a 12 year old thinking about all of this already. What a world we live in, right? Next thing I knew, 
I fell asleep with the razor clutched into my hands. Yeah, I fell asleep in this man's house who I didn't even know. I couldn't even call my dad because my phone had fallen somewhere in his house during all the scuffle and everything. But eventually, my dad got home and immediately threatened Pete, grabbed our things and we went to a motel until I was able to go back to my mother's place. Needless to say, that was the worst summer of my entire life. This is a story that uh, I tell pretty frequently actually to friends, but to this day, I, uh, I still haven't told either of my parents. I'm 23 now, and this must have happened when I was uh, 11 or 12, I'd say, because I was still in middle school at this time. Growing up, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, mostly because both of my parents worked long shifts and long hours. It wasn't uncommon that I would even spend the night at theirs during the school week since my middle school was just a few blocks away and I could walk there in about 15 minutes. As most kids, I was raised with two core, if not conflicting, principles. One, respect your elders, and two, do not talk to strangers. My grandparents' house is also in an area that's about a five minute walk to the local Walgreens, I'd say, and about the same to a small shopping center and... Uh, this is important for the story. Anyways, so my grandma was a diabetic and had broken a hip at some point, so she couldn't really walk long distances. But given that my grandpa liked spending his days out on the streets, and my grandma knowing that I could be trusted to walk from school to home, she would occasionally give me money and send me on errands, either to Walgreens or the small 99 cent store in the shopping center. It was during one of these errands that I was actually almost kidnapped. At least, I think I was. So my grandma had given me a few dollars and had asked me to go to the dollar store since we had run out of her almond cookies and they were the only really sweet thing that she could eat. But to be honest, I didn't mind since I was just watching TV and eating anyway. It was around 4.30 so I made the quick walk to the store, bought my items and was headed back home around 4.45 or 5 o'clock. The streets on the corner heading home from the shopping outlet form an X, with the exit out onto the streets being right next to the crosswalk. As I was standing there just waiting for the light to change, I noticed a, a truck pull up to the exit, idle before hearing the engine turn off, and I watched as an older man, nearing his uh, late 40s I'd say, exited the driver's side and approached me at the corner. At first, I thought that he was going to need directions as... It had happened to me before, but he just kind of stood there, watching me. I was feeling a bit unnerved now and asked if I could help him with something. He started asking me a million questions like where I went to school, what I was doing, where I was going. I distinctly remember this next part because his statements just made no sense. He asked why I was ditching school at nearly 5pm. Middle school's here... Let out at 3.30, mind you, which I stated, and he started calling me a liar and getting closer to me. He became really angry at this point and said that boys shouldn't lie and that I had to come with him so that he could take me back to school. I remember being really scared because the lights wouldn't change and he was being really loud, but I didn't want to break the law by crossing on a red light. He reached out to grab me and, thankfully, the walk sign finally came on, so... I just ran as fast as I could across the street. I remember him yelling at me asking where I was going and why I wouldn't go with him if I had done nothing wrong, to which I replied, because I just don't want to. I ran all the way back home that day, making sure to cut through the alley and go in through the back door just in case he followed me. My grandma was sitting in the same spot that I had left her and didn't even notice me coming through the back, so I just gave her her cookies and sat back down to watch TV. I remember being really afraid to tell her, so I didn't, and I didn't tell my mum when she picked me up either. I don't know if it was an actual kidnap attempt, but something strange was going on with that guy, and all I can put it down to is that he wanted me to get in that truck, and he was going to take me somewhere, that's for sure. I was out for a drive this evening through some back roads outside of my small open town around 
10.30 or 11 p.m. I'd say. I've driven these roads dozens of times before and never had an issue. Until tonight, that is. Just as a preface to... There are little to no houses along these specific roads and there's never traffic, so it's really isolated. So, I'm cruising around the twisty roads just enjoying myself and kind of in my zone when I come over the crest of a right turn that goes up a hill which then sweeps down into a flat left turn which has a guardrail along the right side of the road. As I crest the hill, I was going fairly slow too, at 40 or 50 as there are often deer and opossums in the area. I notice a, a moving figure along the guardrail. I begin to slow down more, as I figure it's a deer and I don't want to hit it. But as I get closer, I realize that it's not a deer. It actually looks like a, a man. At this point, I'm barely moving, just kind of creeping forward as to get closer to it. And I realize that it is a man who's crouched down in a sort of slav squat and he's now turned around to look at me. In my headlights, the first things I notice are he's not wearing any clothes, save for a pair of tidy whities or some sort of adult diaper or something. His eyes are oddly large too for an adult man and just completely brown or black, and his skin is just ghostly white. As I approach, I turn my brights on and he didn't even flinch. By now, I've completely stopped and started to reach down to get my phone as I wanted to actually take a video. But this was a huge mistake. I looked away for a split second to just grab my phone from the passenger seat and as I'm starting to look down, he starts sprinting right at me and he's running directly towards me. He gets up to my window and just starts screaming like a banshee and... Not just like a man yelling, but like all the rage he's ever felt is coming out at that one moment, and it's directed at me. He starts pounding on the window with his fists, all the while screaming his head off. This lasts for about three seconds, I'd say, before I just throw it into first gear and peel out of there as quickly as I can. As I'm accelerating, the first gear in my car takes me to about uh, 40 miles per hour, I'd say. I look in my rear view and realize that somehow... He's keeping up with me. It's not until I get in second and then third and take it up to around 80 that I can no longer see him. He was just running at inhuman speeds trying to keep up with me and I have no idea how he was doing it. I flew the rest of the way home afraid to stop or look at my mirrors and I got into the driveway and just ran inside and decided to share this. I have no idea what I encountered tonight or how that guy was keeping up with me, but I hated every second of it. All I know is that I'll be finding other routes to take when I take my nighttime drives in the future, just to be sure that I never see that guy again. So, first for a little backstory. I've worked on and offered a psych hospital for... The past nine years, I'd say. It used to be a regular hospital too, but eventually it was bought out and turned into a standalone psych facility. For the most part, I've worked overnights in the children's unit, which used to be the maternity ward when it was the old hospital. The main part of the unit is a, a hallway with a nurse's station, bedrooms, a, a day room and a quiet room too. The quiet room is just a, a small empty room that can be used as a timeout for the kids or locked seclusion if necessary. Overall, it was a pretty cake job. I would get to work 15 minutes early and just finish everything I needed to do for the night as fast as possible, and then just post up in a big comfy chair at the end of the hallway and read a book or watch Netflix on my phone until it was time to wake all the kids up. In my nine years there, I've had a lot of creepy and paranormal experiences, but the ones I'm about to share today are the ones I've always considered to be real because it wasn't me that experienced them but the patients on our units. So one night between 3 and 4 a.m. a very young patient came out of his room because he was having trouble sleeping in his room. We let him take his pillows and blankets and set up a mat on the floor of the quiet room so that he could lay down in there. He stayed in there for 
almost an hour I'd say, and then brought his pillows and blankets near me and sat down. Since patients aren't supposed to just chill in the hallway and all that, I told him that he needed to go back to the quiet room and he listened. A few minutes later, he came back out and this time the nurse came out of the nurse's station and told him that he needed to go back into the quiet room or go back into his bedroom. The patient went back into the quiet room and a few minutes later, he came out again and sat down by me. I didn't really care if this kid was out in the hallway or not to be honest, but I know the nurse did so I told him that he better get into the quiet room and go to sleep otherwise he'd just end up getting himself in trouble. When I said this though, the kid just started crying his eyes out and said, I can't. When I asked him why, he said that because there was a man in the quiet room just staring at him. At this point, I was just like... Okay, whatever, just stay out here, and didn't think too much of it, to be honest. But fast forward about six months later, we had a patient on our unit that was a lot more mature than most patients that we ever had. He really should have been on a teenager unit, but he was just shy of the age limit, so he was stuck on a unit with little kids half his age and half his size, mind you. Anyway, he would wake up around the same time every night, between 3 and 4 a.m., and not be able to fall back to sleep. So, he would stand in his doorway and just talk to me and I would never really give him any issue about this because he was pretty chill and it gave me a break from just staring at my book on my phone. One night though, in the middle of our conversation, he abruptly stopped and asked who's standing in the quiet room and when I said no one, his face just went pale. I asked what was wrong and he told me that he swore that he saw a man just staring at him from the quiet room door. And when he looked back after asking me who it was, the man was just gone. I told him the story about the little kid who told me that he saw a man staring at him in the quiet room. And we both had a good chill down our spines and the kid said screw this and just went back into his room. So... Fast forward again about a year or two now and we have this little girl in our unit who was just non-stop chaos. Very, very tiny and couldn't speak a single word that made sense, just garbled sounds. Always trying to bite us and scratch us and seemingly never slept too. Everyone would say that she was possessed. She definitely wasn't, mind you, but anyway. One night after being bitten and scratched for hours straight, she was finally ordered into lock seclusion in the quiet room. It was about 15-20 uh, minutes I'd say before she just started screaming bloody murder and pounding her hands on the door to the point where her hands actually started bleeding. We let her out of the quiet room immediately and as soon as we unlocked the door she burst through it pointing at the room screaming the boy, the boy just over and over again. It certainly put a scare in me as it made me remember the other two patients who said that they saw someone in the quiet room. After everything was calmed down, I, I grabbed some rags and disinfectant spray to go clean the door off after the kid pounding on it to the point of blood, and I felt just really uneasy going into that room after a kid screaming the boy, just beating their fists bloody to get out of there too. So when I opened the door back up, I slowly stuck my head inside to look around expecting to see a ghost or something, but the room was just completely empty but right after I pulled my head out of the room and opened the door up wider so that I could get inside, the light inside the room, it went out. Well, I noped out of there and I let someone else clean that shit room. Anyway, I always thought that this was an interesting one because, well, three separate patients saw someone in our quiet room and I may have experienced something paranormal myself in fact. I have lots of creepy stories from this hospital and my own life too that I wouldn't mind sharing in the future if anyone would be interested in hearing them. But let me know in the comments section below. I lived in three different houses in Kuwaita in different parts of the town as a little girl and experienced uh, hauntings and supernatural encounters just everywhere I went. My very first memories, in fact, are in that town, and some of them, they still scare me. But there's a, 
just a lot of history and a lot of old buildings and homes in Kawita. The first house I lived in was right across from some woods too. My three siblings and I used to play there all the time and one day we decided to go in further than we ever had. I was about four years old at the time and we found an old dilapidated shack. As we got closer to it, the leaves to my left flew up, almost in like a, a straight line like they would for a sudden gust of wind or something. But there was definitely no wind there. It stopped right in front of me and then there was a really loud and deep man's voice all around us that screamed to get out. Needless to say, we just ran like hell. I was the youngest and smallest and the first one out of there too. And after this, I would always see this old man at the edge of the woods. He would stay there like he was guarding them or something. But my mother asked me one day why I was so afraid of the woods and I told her because of the bad man. She inquired further and I told her that there was a bad man that didn't want us in the woods anymore. She brushed it off and life just kind of went on from that point. So we moved away for a couple of years until my parents divorced. My mother moved us into a, a small two bedroom house that was close to our schools and she was sleeping on a fold out couch and us kids had the two bedrooms. It was also right next to a cemetery too and we would play there sometimes as curious children often do. There was always this uh, man there too, probably in his early 30s that would visit his mother's grave every single day in fact. And he was there every single time that we went, no matter what time it was. He'd pack food and even camp out there, talking away on his grave all day. We were intrigued, I, I must admit. We would hide behind gravestones and try to hear what he was saying. I don't remember ever being able to make anything out, but his facial expressions and body movements were so casual that it was like there was someone sitting in front of him just keeping up the banter. But one day, my oldest brother and I managed to get really close. We thought that we were so slick and all of a sudden the man just stood up, turned around, looked right at us and said, What are you looking at, kid? and then just started speaking in a different voice in a, a language that we sure didn't understand. It sounded like, uh, like well thought out gibberish or something, if that makes sense. It's possible that he was just messing with us, but man, it was certainly creepy. And after that, I just stopped going into that area. After a short time though, we ended up moving into downtown Coeda. It was literally one street with small buildings neatly aligned on either side. We lived on the side of the street that was once a cemetery back when the town was first settled in the 1840s. But when they decided to build houses, they moved all of the graves. Well, I found out through my lack of supervision and constant curiousness that they built houses on top of graves eventually. There were gravestones and crawl spaces of at least three of the homes there. There was a very old white two-storied house that sat a block from our house too and we saw multiple families move in and out only a few months later. The house was empty most of the time and my oldest brother, myself and my cat climbed into the crawl space one day. We attempted to turn a stone over so that we could try to read it with our flashlight and as we did, something hissed at us. And this was not a, a normal animal sound, nothing like it. It was like a, a hundred voices all just hissing at once in different frequencies. The hair all over my body just stood up on end and we freaked out and, and my brother was the first out and my cat was second and then me. As I got to the sidewalk, I saw my cat get picked up and thrown too. Someone grabbed my hair and pulled me to the ground and I was so scared that I just started crying. My cat hid in my mum's closet and wouldn't come out until the next day and I ended up having a giant bruise on my right butt cheek. After that, it was hard for me to even walk past that house because, well, I still can't explain what happened there. In this same house, with the graves in the crawl space, I would often see a, an old woman too. I wasn't the only one who saw her too, but I did more than the others and I mostly saw her at night but sometimes in the day as well. And at night, I would often wake up to, I swear, see her standing by my dresser, which 
was just in front of the door. She was illuminated by the hall light my mum would leave on for us, and she would just stare at us and move her mouth, but I couldn't hear anything that she was saying. And on three or four occasions, she actually put her hand on my crayons that were on my dresser, and the next day, they were just all moldy and dried up. I have no idea why she did that, but she did, and my mum just kept replacing them and still never believed me. Also, the stuff would just turn on by itself all the time, and there were the typical footsteps and whispers, doorknobs rattling, all that stuff. And to be quite honest, it was a pretty terrifying childhood in Coweta, Oklahoma. So I'm a junior in college, and whenever I think about this incident or tell the story, it, uh just still makes me shake kind of and it felt like it happened yesterday so a little bit of background first i know it's hard for some people to believe this but i grew up in a haunted house there was an incident where a bucket flew across the room and almost hit me in the eighth grade something rubbed my leg while i was doing my hair in the bathroom once roughly ninth or tenth grade and just different stuff like that would happen on top of all of this too, I've also seen these like shadow people and some friends even have too. And emotionally, well, dang man, the environment was just absolutely toxic. Just dark and I don't know how else to explain it, but it was just evil. And while I had experienced different things growing up, when I got to early high school, things just really escalated and by the time that this story happens it was the beginning of my senior year and it was the worst of it so when i was a senior in high school i mainly binge shows and just did homework i didn't do a whole lot outside of this mainly because i didn't have my license or a car or anything and my life basically just consisted of tv homework being a small group leader on wednesdays for a youth group and a leader for kids ministry on sundays and whatnot and that was just pretty much honestly it. I have a big family and at this point my three older siblings moved out so it was just me, my twin and my parents. I was used to always having someone in the house but unfortunately not at this point. We lived out in the country of northwestern Pennsylvania. My twin sister let me know that she had to leave for school early so that she can drive and cover a shift for work and all that. My dad worked about an hour away from our house, so he would not get back home until around 7, maybe later sometimes, and my mum was just out of town. So I get off the school bus at around 3pm, and I immediately go upstairs to my room to continue binging house. Around 4pm, I notice a, a noise coming from below in my parents' bedroom. I quickly wrote this off as our cats, though. However, the noise persisted and started getting louder, too. So, around 4.30, I sat up in bed and listened, and it sounded like someone was throwing things and breaking things and tearing through things downstairs. Honestly, I just sat there kind of startled, in fear, and I didn't move. And for the next half an hour, I just listened, and man, it got real loud at one point. So... I got off my bed and quietly rested my feet on the tile flooring, and I could even feel it. I could feel vibrations coming from underneath my feet. The noise was that loud. Now, you may be thinking, why didn't you just call someone? Well, I didn't get a cell phone until a few months after this, and at this point, we no longer had a landline either. And so, I stood still for the next half an hour, and... I just didn't know what to do. At this point, it was around 5.30ish and I was just bawling my eyes out because I was so scared. And the noise is just so loud that it's beginning to hurt my ears too. But then, the noise just suddenly stopped. Just out of nowhere, it just stopped. And for some reason, this scared me more because whatever was down there had nowhere to go but up the stairs to me 
and I had no way to defend myself and at this point I thought it could have been an intruder or something. But I literally found a dinner plate and a wooden drumstick for my drum set, you know, and it was in my room so I was just holding these in my hand just waiting for something to happen. And I was shaking so bad that I almost dropped everything. I was listening and just waiting there, just trying to hear something and I swear that I heard someone creeping up the stairs. I heard the step creak and I threw the plate in the hallway and one of my cats walked into the room and, and now I know the creeping up the stairs couldn't have been her either. All of our cats run up and down the stairs anyway and you could hear the difference but then there was just nothing. Nothing happened. I stood there shaking and just crying for the next half hour, not knowing what the hell to do and and then I heard the front door around 6 and my twin announced she was home. I ran downstairs crying and she was so confused and I tried to tell her but I was so worked up and crying so much that I couldn't explain it well enough. I said, look with me please and we walked across the living room to the entrance of my parents bedroom and I turned the light on and to my surprise absolutely everything was in place. To this day I'm really anxious about being home by myself, and I'm so glad that I don't live in that place anymore. After the bank took our house, we all just kind of parted our ways for college, and then uh, my parents divorced too. It was actually a good thing, and they're kind of best friends now. And to be honest, I'm not sure if I should warn the new owners about the house, or if I should just be done with it. So, I was out in the country lands of Texas on this remote trail, mountain biking. It was an area I liked to ride when I would go into town, and while riding through, I saw an older man ahead just walking strangely, but I remember that he was looking straight up at the sky. I see him about 60 yards ahead of me, and it's a singular track, so I don't have room to go around him, so I simply stop and he hears me break and turns to me, now with his head level and looking at me. And... What happened next made my skin crawl and I'll never forget it. He starts talking and waving his arms but his voice sounds nothing like he looks. It honestly sounded like a, like a child talking and sounded scared but it was obviously a guy that was 50 plus years old. He keeps talking but it's like someone is playing a recording from his body with his animations and mouth just not lining up and his voice sounding off. And well, I just turned around and booked it back to where I parked my car and left quickly. Now, I know that he could have just been a, a wilderness loony with a child's voice, but, but there were no other cars at the trail entrance and he was a good five miles in without any gear or clothes that match a hiker or any sort of wilderness person at all. Plus, the sounds that he was making and the way that he was talking without things lining up was just impossible. Man, I hate remembering how he sounded in my head too. Alright, so first off, I'm 16 and I'm an atheist and most of my life... I've never believed in the paranormal, but lately, I'm kind of revisiting events in my head that happened to me a while ago, and no matter how hard I try, I just can't find a solution for this stuff. So, when I was 10, my parents and I moved into a house. I don't live there anymore, but we had to leave our apartment as soon as possible, and not long after we moved in, I experience some just really weird shit. And the way the upstairs was set up is that as soon as you walk up the stairs, there's a bedroom and then there's a door that leads to a smaller one. I had the larger bedroom accessible by the stairs and it also had two closets. So about a week after we moved in, I was trying to sleep and my parents wanted me to go to bed early but I've always had problems sleeping. Keep in mind that I was wide awake and not drifting off at all at this point. So, I don't think that this was sleep paralysis or a lucid dream or anything. 
I was even on my iPod and just listening and clicking buttons and all that. My cat was sitting next to me on my bed and all of a sudden I just hear this screaming coming from one of the closets, like really loud too. It stopped for about 5 seconds and then just started again and it repeated about 10 more times and then just stopped. I could even hear the scream echo and it sounded like a girl who was probably around my age at the time I think. I looked in the direction of the closet and so did my cat with his ears back and I didn't see anything. The next day I told my parents and they didn't hear a thing and my dad didn't even believe me in fact. When my mum was alive, she experienced some weird things there as well. For example, she heard someone say a name, but it sounded like me when I was dead sleeping. Whatever it was, it didn't even say mum, but her actual name. She woke up, but realised I wasn't the one who called her, and I just went back to sleep, and so did she. Another time, I was taking a shower, and all of a sudden... I heard a girl's voice say hi. I almost shit myself too and I turned the water off and ran downstairs with a towel on and made my mum come upstairs and stay in the room while I got dressed because I was just that scared to be alone. I also spent the rest of the night downstairs with her on the couch. Another time, my mum was upstairs showering and I was on the couch downstairs and all of a sudden I heard my name get called really loudly, like in her exact voice too, so... I ran upstairs after hearing it, thinking that something was wrong, and it was about three times that I heard it, and she was still showering and all that, and I said to her, is everything okay, what do you want? She was really confused, and she told me that she never called me though. I'd also noticed just small things misplaced, and eventually finding them somewhere else that I knew that they were not left. So yeah, that's all for now. As of right now, I live in my mum's childhood home with my dad and I've experienced some things here too. So did my mum and grandpa when they were alive and that's for another time though I guess. I just never understood what all of this was and I don't want to believe that it was a spirit or spirits but to be honest with you, I just can't come up with any other logical answer. Let me know what you guys think. I'd love to hear from you. Back in 2008, I was a student planning to go to university and needed some extracurricular stuff that I could put on my entry applications. As most UK students know, one of the best to have on there is the Duke of Edinburgh Award. As a part of this award, you have to embark on an orienteering expedition. It's basically a long trek through woodland and rural villages following nothing but a map and a compass and no GPS allowed. It's a teamwork experience and you camp and just kind of overcome hurdles together and all that type of stuff. Anyway, I was out of shape at the time and so my uncle volunteered to take me out to the middle of nowhere to get some idea of what orienteering was like. We didn't stay out overnight like I would have to during the real thing but... We hiked maybe 10 miles through the woods and a small village in pretty abysmal weather too. But by the end of the journey, we were soaked to the bone and honestly pretty miserable. But looking forward to just getting back to the car and heading home. But for the last part of the journey, we were on a dirt trail heading uphill with bushes and trees either side. We were marching onward in silence at this point when, all of a sudden, there was a, a rustling in the foliage to our left. And from behind a large bush stepped out a, an old man in a black suit with a red bow tie and dress shoes. He looked to be a, a late 70s, early 80s maybe. Really pale and liver spots dotting his face and a grey or white comb over. Honestly, I was instantly weirded out. I mean, who dresses like that to go into the woods, right? The instant thought seeing a guy this age out there in those clothes and these types of weather conditions was this guy has lost his marbles. There was something else that took me an extra moment to notice though that, that kind of puzzled me. The guy was bone dry but didn't even have mud on his shoes. We stopped in our tracks and just stared at the man for a moment who 
appeared to be as frozen and shocked at seeing us as we him. My uncle made the first move, taking a step towards him, asking if he was alright. The old man continued to stare for a moment, not even moving an inch, and then it became suddenly very animated. It was like he suddenly just snapped out of a trance, and he started flailing his arms wildly, saying something awful had happened, that a good friend of his needed help. He began walking backwards into the woods, motioning for us to follow him, and we did. We started off at a brisk walk and then escalated to running as we struggled to keep up with the old man. After maybe a minute, he just disappeared ahead of us, but we could hear him, so we continued to follow the noise until we reached a huge slope. We stopped at the edge and looked down to see the old man just standing at the bottom, motioning us, pleading with us to follow him. I remember looking down the slope that was probably at a 40 degree angle I'd say and spanned for perhaps 50 feet or more and it was slick with mud. It looked like an accident waiting to happen to be honest, especially given that there were no shrubs or roots to hold onto or anything. I remember looking down at the old man on the other side of the slope and just kind of wondering how the heck did he cross that so quickly and so cleanly too. I mean, at that distance, it is hard to see fine detail clearly, but I swear that he still did not appear to be wet or even muddy at all. Well, me and my uncle just kind of looked at each other and I saw that he was getting as weirded out as I was. Despite my feelings, I made a step toward the edge and was going to try and make my way down when my uncle grabbed me firmly by the arm and just pulled me back. Under his breath, he said to me, something's wrong here. We took a few steps back from the edge at this point and the old man at the bottom started getting irate. He began pleading with us again to just come down the slope, telling us that he needed our help, his friend was in trouble. My uncle shouted down to the old man that we would head back to our car and call emergency services for him, that professional help would be on its way soon, that they would have all the tools to help him and all that. The old man though just suddenly got furious and he began jumping up and down, demanding that we come down the slope right now or there would be hell to pay. His voice had changed drastically too and he was practically growling his words. His hands bunched up into fists, pounding his knees like a an angry toddler throwing a tantrum. I've honestly never seen a grown adult fly into such a rage in my life. His eyes looked like they were on the verge of bursting out of their sockets in fact. His skin had gone from pale to red in almost an instant. Well, we began to hurriedly make our way back the way that we had come, and his demands and threats were just getting less audible as we got closer to the trail. But once on the trail, we practically power marched the remaining quarter mile or so to the car, all the while with my uncle on his phone to the emergency services explaining to them that there was a possible mentally ill old man just wandering the trail. We were ordered to get to our car and just await the police so that we could show them where we had encountered him. About an hour later, we met four officers, a tomb whom had dogs with them and packs of supplies like first aid and emergency blankets, etc. We led them to the exact spot and then pointed the two officers with the dogs in the direction that he led us through the bushes. The search lasted all weekend, but there was absolutely no trace of the old man. In fact, the officers said that the only trail that they could pick up had been mine and my uncle's. They didn't even find any footprints or anything belonging to the old man that we had encountered. Quite honestly, it's one of the weirdest and creepiest experiences that I've ever had. So last night, I was at a classmate's house working on a group project that we have due tomorrow. I live in an apartment in the town where our university is located and my classmate lives at his parents' house which is in the foothills just outside of town. In order to get to the house, you have to drive along a relatively secluded and narrow two-lane road for about five to six miles. We started working on the project at uh, about 6pm I think and I ended up hanging around for a while after we had finished our working. So, I left his house pretty late at about 11 I think and started down the road back towards town. I didn't realise how tough it would be to navigate the road at night. There were no street lights and the road was unkept and just riddled with potholes everywhere. And on top of this, 
I had no cell service, so I had to drive very slowly to make sure that I didn't blow out my tires since I had used my spare a couple of weeks back. I figured I was about uh, three miles from the house when I ran at a tight corner and saw a pickup truck with a camper shell just parked diagonally across the road. The manner in which it was parked completely impeded my path and I couldn't drive around it because there was a gully on both sides of the road. The only way for me to go at this point was backwards where there was a pull off that I could use to turn my car around. At first I couldn't see inside the cab but when I turned on my high beams I saw that there was a man just slouched over in the driver's seat, his head resting against the steering wheel as if he'd been knocked out after a bad accident or something. I immediately sensed something was wrong though because the way the cart had just coincidentally come to rest in a position that totally blocked the road was a huge red flag for me. I had heard of stories of people playing dead in the road as a, a way to lure unsuspecting people out of their cars so that they could rob them and I decided to fuck this shit and elected to go back to my classmate's house and explain what was going on. I threw the car into reverse and kept my eyes darting back and forth between my rear view and the truck. I looked and saw that I was almost to the pull off where I could turn around and when I looked back, my heart skipped about five beats. But the man who had been slouched over in the driver's seat was now walking at my car at a hurried pace while a few other men jumped out of the camper shell and started moving towards me as well. I panicked and accelerated backwards into the pull-off which messed up the undercarriage of my car pretty bad. As I put it into drive, the guy was already at my passenger side door tugging on the handle which, thank the lord, was locked. I only caught a brief glimpse of him but his face appeared to be scabbed and leathery, definitely a meth head or some sort of drug user for sure. I sped away and didn't slow down at all until I reached the house, just constantly checking over my rear view to see if they were following me. Thankfully, they didn't tail me and when I reached the house, I explained what had happened to my classmate and we called the cops straight away. I was grateful that my buddy's parents were kind enough to let me stay that night. They didn't find anyone on the road matching the description, but I filed an incident report and they told me that they would be on the lookout for similar vehicles and suspicious activity. But holy shit, am I still so shook up over it. I keep getting the same adrenaline rush that I got when I saw the guy charging me whenever I think about it. Anyway, if you have any similar experiences, uh, I would appreciate a, a good read if you wouldn't mind sharing. You can leave them in the comment section below and thanks for listening. I was around 10 or 11 when this happened and I was home alone. The doorbell rang while I was watching TV, so I hastily moved my bowl of cereal and got up to answer the door. It was the mailman who said that we had gotten a package, but it was apparently so big that he needed help carrying it. Something felt just really off about this guy as he wasn't wearing a uniform and he was in a, a dirty white shirt and jeans. I asked him where his truck was because I didn't see it parked out front and he said it was around the corner and just to follow him out to grab my parcel. He kept telling me to go with him but I politely said that I wasn't feeling well and that we would just get our mail from the post office and whatnot. He said how much of a hassle that would be and to just go out and get it then and there. I said that I had to get my shoes on from upstairs and he waited outside. I locked the door and bolted upstairs closing all the windows and I called my mum to come home and explained everything. The man was still outside and he shouted at me asking if I'd gotten my shoes and I replied that my mum was coming because she's much stronger and could carry the package for me. And once I said that, he was quick to run and I never saw his face again. They never did catch him and I hope that he never lured any kids and tricked them into going near that van but <laughs> he sure was one hell of a creepy male man. So I live in an apartment complex with my husband and 13 month old baby in a bad area of my city. Last night my husband was at work, he works until 11pm most days and I just kept hearing a, a strange noise from near my balcony. 
I turned the porch light on expecting to see a stranger with a toothy grin and a knife in his hand. But instead, I saw nobody and went back to what I was doing. Again, I heard a strange noise and nervously checked and nobody and nothing. I thought to myself that if it was just my neighbours outside that I was probably weirding them out by opening the slider door so often and turning the light on and turning it off and turning it back on again etc. So I came back inside and shoved some headphones into my ear hole so that I could stop frightening myself. But this worked beautifully and I forgot all about the noises that I heard. Typically speaking, around 9.30 or so, I usually take a hot and relaxing bath to just prepare my mind for slumber. I got caught up with something on the interwebs though and I ended up not getting up from my kitchen until right before 10pm. Around the time that I arose to bathe, I heard a pounding outside of my apartment door. I glanced out of my apartment's peephole and I didn't see anyone. I can only see one other apartment, but there are four on my floor, out of the peephole. However, since I'm nosy, I decided to wait until maybe I could see this person. I mean, they were really pounding on the door quite hard. It was shaking my apartment door, in fact. And after probably eight minutes or so, the pounding just stopped. I waited, and still no one. The neighbours hadn't answered their door either, and you can hear everything through these doors. The silence continued for maybe five minutes or so, and a couple of minutes after I walked away, it began again. This time, though, it sounded like it was my door. Now, I'm a very anxious person, and I do not like being alone in my apartment at night, and refuse to open the door if I don't absolutely have to. So, I cautiously looked through the peephole, and... I saw absolutely nothing again. This really terrified me and I messaged my husband and he told me to call our building security. The pounding got louder and louder and then it stopped for several minutes and then abruptly continued. And this went on for quite some time. I stared out my door's peephole, wondering what the fuck was going on as I just tried to rationalize what was happening. Maybe someone's actually knocking on the neighbor's door and it just sounds like they're knocking on mine. Maybe someone's locked outside and is pounding on that door. And then, my thoughts were disrupted as someone began to scratch at my door. My apartment door is metal, so I could distinctly hear the sound of a person's nails running across it. I glanced at the peephole, terrified at what creepy creature I might discover. And again, no humans in sight. I then decided that I should go to the closet in my bedroom and call security away from the front door and far enough away from my baby's bedroom so that she couldn't hear me. But right as I was about to walk away, I saw something through the peephole that made me audibly gasp. I saw a man slowly stand up. I had never seen his face before and I couldn't see him prior to him standing because the peephole doesn't see that far downwards. I'm pretty sure that he was crouching down and just waiting for me to open my door to see what the hell was happening and then do who knows what. Man, am I glad that I did not open that door. And obviously, I called security and the police. But the guy, he was long gone by then. So, it was late one night and I decided that the middle of the night was when I wanted to go to the local 24-hour grocery store to get a few snacks. At the time, I didn't own a car but I did have a license and my father had a car and since I was young, I figured I could take the car and drive the few miles to the store to pick up some snacks and be back having the car in the driveway before anyone knows that I was gone. So this story happened many years ago when I was 19 years old and lived with my parents at home in a fairly bad neighborhood. At the time, I had a large loving dog that was half Great Dane and half English Mastiff who was the sweetest little angel that you could ever meet, but absolutely massive. We're talking over 5 feet on her hind legs and well over 100 pounds. So it was late one night and I decided that the middle of the night was when I wanted to go to a local 24 hour grocery store to get a few snacks. At the time, I didn't own a car, but I didn't have a license, and my father 
At the time, I didn't own a car, but I did have a license and my father had a car. But since I was young, I figured that... Uh, since I was young, I figured that I could take the car and drive the few miles to the store to pick up my snacks and be back having the car in the driveway before anyone knows that I was gone. The only issue was that I knew that my dog would start barking and crying if I left her alone while I went to the store. So... I decided that I would take her with me and leave her in the car and just quickly duck in and get stuff. And since it's the middle of the night, it wasn't going to be hot and all was going to be okay. I get to the store and get out and I pick up a few snacks and pay the total and head back to the car. It's the early 2000s and my keys are on a lanyard around my neck and as I'm walking quickly towards my father's car... I notice in my peripheral vision that there's a man who's gotten up from a bench on the side of the building. I hear him say something, but I don't turn around and have no clue what it was. I start to quicken my pace and wonder if I'm being paranoid, but by the time I open my car door, this man was in full sprint towards me. I slam the car door shut and before I can even lock the door, I see a hand slam on my window, full palm. In the next split second, my beautiful, amazing, huge dog lunges from the passenger seat across my driver's seat towards the window, with teeth and barking, and I had never seen her act like that before. Then, I hear an oh shit before the man just disappeared off into the darkness. I got home safe that night, and nothing came of it. The neighborhood that the store was located is notorious for panhandlers and thefts and robberies, so... I can't tell you for sure what that person wanted from me, but I got a pretty good idea. I don't know if they would have hurt me or if I was just overreacting, but what I can tell you is that I'm very glad that my dog was with me that night. Just to give you a bit of background, I'm a female and I drive for Lyft at night. I'm on the shorter side at 5.4 and have been driving for nearly 6 months now. I tend to drive downtown Denver, especially on weekends when there's the most money to make. In this time, I've only had a couple of truly scary encounters and I drive 7 nights a week at least a couple of hours at night. So, the first scary one, it started out normally enough for that late at night. I had just dropped off a passenger in Aurora and was marking my way back towards Market Street since the bars hadn't closed yet. I get a pickup that's on the way and it's a nice enough area that I don't feel uncomfortable about but anyone who knows Aurora CO knows that it's not really the best area even with the few nice areas. A couple of guys hop in, one in the front, one in the back, both have on hoodies and are carrying backpacks but this is Colorado and almost 1.30 in the morning so... It wasn't anything odd. But where it gets a little strange is after they get in. I give them my normal greeting, but they completely ignore me and shove their backpacks onto the floor and they pull their hoods up while shielding their faces from the windows with their hands. I was instantly uncomfortable and I could feel that something was off about them. It was only a 10 minute drive and we were in a secluded area, so... I decided the safest thing that I could do was complete the ride. I could feel my fight or flight instinct kicking in though and within about a minute I had decided if they tried anything I was going to crash my car. And neither one had put on a seatbelt so I figured that that would be my best chance. But once we arrive at the location they wanted to be dropped off at I could tell that it was not a good area. The bars and all the windows, trash everywhere and cars in disrepair. They got out, but they don't shut my doors and start whispering to each other while glancing at me. One of them has his hand in his pocket fidgeting with something. I have no idea what it was. At this point, I've had enough and I just step on the gas driving off with the doors open. I drive a couple of miles until I get to a gas station with lights and people before I stop to properly close both the doors. I called it a night at that point and headed home to just cuddle my toddler and my husband before having a cry in the safety of my own bed. I have no idea what they were planning, but I do know that I was terrified from the moment they pulled their hoods up to the moment that I dropped them off with my doors open. The second story takes place a couple of weeks after this, in fact, and 
I had sworn off all pickups in the Aurora area and the shady parts along Colfax at night. I would still drop people off there, but I would also turn my app off and leave the area when I was done. So I was downtown as usual for Saturday night and the bars were closing. I get a shared ride, which can be very good at bar closing. Now, the thing to know about shared rides is that you can't request more than two seats leaving room for two more people. I have on multiple occasions had a full car with these types of rides too and I get to the person and unlock my doors as normal and in get three people. Okay, small problem but I'm polite and tell them that I can't give them a ride with three people so they'll have to order a different lift. And this is where this one turns. The guy says I don't want to pay more and I say I'm sorry but either one of you has to get out or all of you do and you need to order a different ride. This is a shared ride and that means that I could get two more passengers and they need seats. But with shared rides, you're only allowed to book two seats for two passengers. But the guy says, I'm not paying more so you can just ignore other rides and take us home. At this point, he became pretty aggressive and was putting his finger in my face. Maybe I should have been more scared, but this is Market Street at Barclos and it's absolutely packed at this point. There are drunk people everywhere, and where there are drunk people, there are also cops. So, I roll down my window as he continues to tell me what I'm going to do and starts threatening to punch my bitch ass into its place if I don't start driving right now. I didn't catch the whole sentence since I had made eye contact with a cop and was focusing on getting his attention. I say to the guys, Okay, you now have a choice. You can all get out, or I can get the cop right there to get you out. Said cop was actually making his way over seeing something was wrong. And at this point, they all jumped out with the guy flipping me off, and they disappeared into the crowd still looking for rides. The cop stopped to ask if I was okay, and I gave him a short rundown of what happened and thanked him for coming over. I headed off to my next ride, who was actually a very polite gentleman, and in both cases I reported them to Lyft, so... I wouldn't get paired with either again. I also carry a foam pepper spray for defense and have a dash cam that records the interior of my car now. And since that last one, I haven't had any issues, so I'm grateful for that. I've reached out to the mods with evidence to verify this story. I just have to send them this link after posting, so it may take a little while to get verified, but I'm noting this because I know that this story seems completely ridiculous, but the girl I experienced this with is actually insane. So, a lot of people may have heard about this girl. She was all over the news after she stalked a guy, bombarded him with 65,000 texts, and broke into his house all over one date. We met shortly after she went on that date with him and we were friends for a while before she broke into his house. At first, she seemed like a, a nice albeit quirky person. I met her when I spent a couple of months visiting the west coast of the US in the summer of 2017. I thought that she was cute and we spent a lot of time together. We were living next door to each other for a few weeks and we were never really more than friends. I stopped having any sort of non-platonic feelings after she started talking about a, a guy that she had met on some dating website. Apparently, he was her soulmate and she had somehow been guided to him by following her birth calendar. I would only later come to know that they had only been on one date and he never spoke to her again. I thought that that was weird, but I enjoyed our conversations for the most part, and she was funny and nice, so we remained friends, and eventually she moved on to short flings with a, a guy and then another girl from Tinder, all the while still talking to me about this guy that she was going to marry, saying that she liked how jealous he got when she would tell him about hooking up with other people. A couple of weeks later, and she started to get really erratic too. I confronted her a few times about how she was acting, and she told me that she had recently stopped taking her meds but would start taking them again. She came home one day and decided to tell me that she had a court date coming up for a DUI. I have no idea if this is actually true, but if there's a way to find that out, it happened in Arizona and her name is pretty easy to find, so someone could look it up if they wanted to know. Her plan, though, was instead to leave the country and go to South America. 
I told her what a dumb idea that was, and even though she actually went all the way to the airport in a different city, she wound up coming back. Apparently, her soulmate was no longer answering her texts, and she took that as a sign that she should drag her ass back to where he was and fix their relationship. She was upset that he may be seeing other people, even though it seemed okay to her that she was seeing other people. But later on, she told me that she had texted him and said that if he blocked her, she would know that that meant that he wanted her to come and find him. Obviously, he blocked her, and obviously, that didn't go over well with her. So, she moved a couple of days later, and the summer was ending, and I moved back to the East Coast. I didn't hear from her for a while, but then we started talking again through text and WhatsApp. She told me that she found a roommate and was working on her art again and just generally seemed like she was in a better place. I was happy to have my friend back and healthy but that didn't last longer than a couple of months. Eventually her behavior started to seem erratic again. She was sending dozens of texts at a time and they were just all over the place. Several of them had to do with her soulmate and how she was still following him, even though he had called the police and blocked her. I told her to stop and tried to get her to take her meds and tried to reason with her a hundred times. I was on the opposite side of the country though and had no way of getting in touch with her family, who I never knew much about anyway, or friends to try and get them to help her. She was a kind person and a good friend and she was taking care of her mental health and I cared about her but I couldn't force her to take care of herself, right? One day, I set aside some time to call her and I told her that she was overwhelming me and that she really needed to reach out to her family or someone who could help her. She told me I couldn't do that because she needed to stay with me or she would have to go back to her ex-husband. I don't think any of this is true but she thought that her ex-husband was going to have her killed or followed or something. That he had the entire police force in his pocket and had paid her family to give him intel on her whereabouts and what was going on in her life. So I had just moved for a job and I lived in a small studio in a big city. I had no room for anyone to stay long term and I wasn't about to do that anyway since she was honestly starting to scare me at this point. But she asked me if I was still living at my address which really freaked me out because I had never given her my address or put it anywhere online and she wouldn't tell me how she got it too. I asked her to leave me alone and told her that we couldn't be friends anymore unless she took some steps to get better. She obviously didn't take this well. Though I hated my, uh, my tiny cramped apartment, the reason why I was drawn to it was because it had great security. It was actually on the upper floors of a hotel although the hotel rooms were much nicer than the residence, and no one was allowed through the residence elevators unless the resident had given their name to the security ahead of time and the guests had to show ID. After what happened next, I loved my cramped little apartment because the staff, they saved me. So it had to be over a week since I had talked to her because I blocked her number and blocked on WhatsApp. She tried texting me from four different phone numbers, using text free and all that stuff but I just blocked them all and never responded. I was walking home from work one day and I was sure that I saw her across the street from my building but it was storming out and I didn't get a good view so I wasn't sure. I rushed upstairs and calmed myself down in my apartment. Maybe I was just being paranoid. It's a big city, lots of people have brown hair and glasses and I'm just worried about her. But then, the phone rang. The desk was calling to see if I'd forgotten to let them know that I had a visitor. And my heart, it sank. I asked them who was waiting and they said that they tried asking her name or ID but she just walked out. And at that point, I knew that it was her from the way that they described her. I texted a mutual friend from over the summer and I wasn't really close with him so we hadn't stayed in touch but he told me that she had completely lost it and that he had blocked her too. Apparently she had gone back on the dating site that she met her soulmate on and found someone who looked just like him in my city. She was convinced that it was him and had come to find him. This was a very touristy city but there was just no way that this guy had coincidentally come out here. 
I was sure at this point that she had gone completely bonkers and knew that she was well aware of where that guy actually lived. I took a page out of her book and used a text-free number to text her that she should leave me alone and I would call the cops if she ever came near me on my building again. In retrospect, I just shouldn't have contacted her at all, but I was emotional and not using my better judgement. She said that she just wanted to know if I could help her find something. I texted back really fucking fast too and didn't even try to hide it. Then, I deleted the text-free app so she couldn't reach me again. Now, I lived in a very crowded area and I knew that she couldn't get into my building, but I was still scared whenever I had to take public transit alone at night or was walking through less crowded areas to get home. I had a friend who used to work for the police, but not in this city or at the time this all happened, and she would drive or walk me home from work whenever she could for a while. She told me that I should go ahead and report it, even though they couldn't really do anything since she hadn't hurt me and nothing had really happened, but I was embarrassed and, again, I didn't use my better judgement. I felt like it was my fault for engaging with her for so long and I knew that she was mentally unstable and I would still try to be a friend and help her and all that. Maybe I gave her the wrong idea that I could do more for her or something. Anyway... I ended up moving to a new city for another job after that and didn't hear from her again. I later found out the reason why was that a couple of months later, she had once again gone back to Arizona and had been arrested for breaking into a soulmate's house and using his bathtub. They found a large knife in her car and I didn't want to go into too much detail about her stalking of that guy and what she said about him in our text because I wanted to try and focus more on my personal experience with her instead of his, but I could answer some questions in the comments if anyone has any. In the end, I don't know what she was there for or what she could have done, but she was totally unstable when she arrived at my place. And who knows, maybe that knife... Maybe it was meant for me. Back in 1998 or 99, I was around 5 or 6 years old and living in a crime and drug ridden part of the downtown area. Our house had a giant backyard that was full of thick jungle like trees and bushes that had been taken over by the earth and also random passerbys. We knew this due to the heroin needles that were around and half a mattress that had once been on a forest floor that had since grown 15 feet into the air with trees. But there was also a path that people would use as a shortcut to the main road so there was a lot of traffic with shady people passing through. When you're a kid, this is a nightmare of a backyard so I was spooked since the time we moved in. I would complain constantly to my mum about someone watching me from outside my window when I would try to sleep. And once or twice, there had been times of him watching me and he had shined a flashlight in my room and I saw a flash of his face which I can still picture. His dark eyes burned through me and for a while I never said anything but eventually I told someone. But my mum always said that it was just a nightmare and I brushed it off for a week or two while ignoring my relentless complaints. Eventually, after having to fight with me to go to sleep one night, my mum had dragged me outside the next morning to prove me wrong. But we went outside to my window and, to her surprise, the grass had been stomped on, only outside of my window to the point that the grass was almost dead and mud remained. There were also tons of scratch marks from a tool of some kind just outside of the window as if someone was trying to break in. I was in a basement with one of those um, small windows that don't open so a breaking in through there is super unlikely but it still shook my family. But my mum was horrified obviously and had started making plans to move but we were so broke growing up that leaving right away was just not an option. Around that time me and my best friend who was also my next door neighbour had become inseparable but we hung out almost constantly and had no sense of danger and would do dumb stuff like go to other neighbors' houses and ask for candy and whatnot. Our favorite was this elderly lady who always had hostess cakes for us and we would actually go inside her house to hang out there. She was unbelievably nice and took care of us in a way and our parents had no idea that we did this but it was our little secret. 
one day, we were playing around the neighborhood and my mum yelled for me to come home so we could go pick up dinner just around the corner. But we were only gone for 15 minutes at most and when we came back to the house, we were in complete shock. The street was closed off with crime scene tape, but there were two of three new station vans, a, a dozen police cars and either a, a life flight helicopter getting ready to touch down or a news helicopter of some sort. Apparently, while we were gone getting our food, a man who was not from the neighborhood but had been staying with his mum for the last few weeks had walked past my best friend's yard and saw her on the phone. She was talking to a friend and making faces or whatever young kids do and this man thought that she was making fun of him and talking about him on the phone. This man got so upset at the thought of someone making fun of him that he walked back to his mum's house and came back with a butcher's knife and was planning on killing this girl for mistreating him. Because of where she was sitting on the porch, she could see him coming back with the knife and ran inside her home and locked herself in the bathroom and called the police with the phone that she luckily already had in her hand. Unfortunately, my friend's mum was in the kitchen and was not so lucky. The man took his anger out on her and stabbed her so many times that I can't even remember the number, but I think it was in the 20s. Somehow, though, she survived and made a full recovery after many surgeries. After his arrest, the story was all over the news and I remember watching it with my mum pretty religiously to make sure that my friend's mum was alright. They posted his mugshot and I remember the most intense amount of fear flowing through me because the man who stabbed this woman was also the man who watched me outside of my window at night. I actually later found out too that we had met this man weeks earlier at the elderly lady's house that we frequented for candy. It was her son and he had initially met us at her house and had been keeping an eye on us ever since. He had only gotten out of prison a month or so earlier too and was staying with her since his release. I just never took note of him when we first met but maybe if I did I would have known right away who my night stalker was and could have perhaps prevented all that happened after. In the end, we never did end up moving. My mum figured that the danger was gone, so that we just stayed another year, and to this day, I never sleep with my blinds open. So a few weeks ago, I was up late and wide awake and realized that I hadn't eaten dinner. It was around midnight, and I wasn't in the mood for drive through and hadn't done grocery shopping. So, I decided to go to my local 24-hour Walmart for a frozen pizza and some ice cream. <laughs> I'm clearly single, right? My city is very middle class, very quiet, very suburbia, so I really was not feeling at all concerned about going. I got to the store and then sat in my car for a minute, just checking a text that I'd received while driving. I saw something out of the corner of my eye, but initially I just ignored it and... I'm in a parking lot, of course, and there's going to be movement, right? However, some gut feeling made me just look over, and I noticed someone was, like, straining to catch a glimpse of me. Now, this isn't too abnormal, because I actually have a shaved head, and I'm a woman, and I get a lot of looks for it on a regular day, especially living in suburbia. But people are always drawn to take an extra glance at the unusual, and... I see people all the time doing the scan because they want to figure out if I'm a guy or a girl, or if I'm sick. I mean, why have I shaved my head, right? I'm not a punk or alternative, and I definitely appear healthy, so I understand to a point that confusion, or, or the stares at least. I don't get that weirdness in the city, but uh, that's beside the point, I guess. So... As I glance at him quickly, I have the old half smile, we both are acknowledging each other so you can stop now, non-verbal thing going. But my state is pretty passive aggressive so that's a thing here too and he quickly looks away. I go back to my text. A tingling feeling on the back of my neck makes me look over though and now I'm really creeped out. He's really staring at me but now that I'm looking closer... I see that the way that he's staring is not at all out of curiosity. I look at his eyes and they're dead and blank and menacing, 
all at the same time, if that makes sense. There's something just about his ice and ice through my gut. I seen that he's in a rusty truck full of weird shit and dirty plastic bags and has a giant smear of what looks like blood all over the passenger door. Like old dried blood. I grew up in a family of hunters, so I know the sight of blood when I see it. And mind you, there was a lot of it. I just had all of my, uh, my instincts screaming that something was terribly, terribly wrong with this guy. But this all takes about uh, 30 seconds, I'm guessing. But to describe his looks, uh, his face kind of was similar to Warren Jeff's. And not that it matters, but I'm just trying to paint a picture here. I should mention too that he was not blinking and he was really straining to see me. He held up his phone without looking at his phone and still not blinking. And then there was a flash. He's just taken a picture of me. I'm scared at this point and my fingers and knees are trembling and I push down on the brake and it takes me a few tries to push the button to start the car. He takes another picture and he starts his truck. And well, I drove right the fuck out of that parking lot and onto the main road. He's following me and I debate calling the police at this point. I'm about to call when I realize that he's not behind me anymore. Okay, so I guess I'm fine then. Everything is good and everything's cool. I took the long way back to the store. Yes, back to the store. Apparently, I'm incredibly stupid. Anyway, I get to the store, a little jumpy, but he's not around. I'm inside with my basket and I have my pizza and now I'm browsing for my ice cream that I'd like and I see another flash. I turn and it's him at the end of the aisle and he's still holding his phone up weirdly without looking at it. His clothes are dirty as hell and now... I'm pissed and I yell, oh fuck this dude, because I get aggressive when I'm scared. I slammed the freezer door shut and began stomping toward him, even though I was fucking terrified, mind you, to try and scare him off and it kind of worked and he ran off. The ice cream is near the register so I grabbed a random one and just very quickly hustled to the register. He wasn't behind me at this point. So I start ringing up and look behind me and... He's in the woman's clothes section, which is right behind the register, and he has his hand on a pile of shirts, and he's kind of fingering or rubbing the shirt on top, and looking at me. I told the cashier as quickly and as quietly as I could what was happening, and she called the MOD, who I guess called the police. She advised me to stay by her, and he must have gathered what was happening and just scampered off at this point. But by the time that the police arrived, he was gone, and... And my shock had worn off and I was visibly upset. The police not only walked me to my car but followed me home too. It's not too far to make sure that I wasn't followed by the creep. I'll never go to that store again and I've been getting just so creeped out coming home at night. I live alone half the time too and my daughters live with me the other half of the time and honestly, I just don't feel safe anymore. I was about 13 or 14 and I was babysitting two boys for some church members. I had done it before and the kids loved me and the parents were very comfortable with me. But this was a night where they were going to be gone for pretty much until like uh, 2.30 in the morning or something. I was doing it for free that day too because they were going to do something church related and that's just how it rolled. Anyway, the house they lived in was in an apartment complex. You know one of those um, small ones that had two floors and four places in each spot? They're on the bottom floor with two bedrooms on either side of the apartment with the kitchen on the left and the living room on the right with the sliding glass door to a small patio and a public bathroom next to the front door. It was about, uh, I think 1.30 and I knew that they should be getting home soon. The kids were knocked out, obviously after begging and three bedtime stories and I had finished my homework and they didn't have cable. This was before Netflix became an online service, so they had a couple of DVDs and VHSs to watch, so I grabbed the Land Before Time to make the night go quicker. 
I was already very tired at this point and had nodded off a couple of times and at about two, I could hear knocking on the front door and knowing the parents had a key, I did nothing but sit there in the dark with the TV glowing. Being a paranoid person and someone who watches and reads enough horror, I grabbed the baseball bat that was next to the couch. And what happened next will haunt me forever. I heard a small voice, almost like a young woman's, say, Oh dear, that won't help you. My heart stopped and I realized the patio door didn't have the blinds shut. My eyes shift slowly to the door and I see someone on the patio staring in. I couldn't make anything out other than that they were very short and wide. I screamed and just ran into the kids room at this point. Thankfully they were still asleep and sadly this was before I had a cell phone and there were no cordless phones. All I did was push the dresser in front of the door and stared at the window of the room. And that's when it became dark as a shadow loomed on the window. The knocking started again and the woman's voice called out. Come on, dearie, I won't hurt you. Please come out. The window was being knocked so hard at this point that I was afraid that it was going to break. But the kids finally woke up and they were screaming and scared and... I was a big girl and could at the time lift my own weight, but knowing that I had two kids with me, I became vulnerable and afraid. But within two seconds, I hear the father yell out, Hey, who the hell are you? And the person just ran off. The front door opened and there was harsh knocking on the kids' bedroom door. Thankfully, it was the parents and after I let them in and put the dresser back, I explained what happened and they called the police. When they arrived, they obviously found nothing, but the bushes that hide the patio were obviously cut up and ripped up to get through. I babysat for them once more after that, but after they moved away about five months later, I never babysat anyone ever again. And again, to this day, I know the woman was long gone, but every time I hear a knock, a chill runs through me. A little background information about me. I have PD, a panic disorder. But for those who don't know what it is, it's a mental illness that causes extreme anxiety, severe panic attacks and just a, a slew of problems. I've been suffering from this for over a year now and while it's getting better, it's still very difficult to deal with and keep this in mind as I tell the story. So, my husband and I have been married a, a little over a year now. The time that we were married, unfortunately, I was undergoing medical issues that no doctors could seem to explain. I was having panic attacks all the time and they would be so severe that I would have to be taken to the ER where they would have to literally sedate me to calm me down. I was also losing weight at a, an exponential and scary rate, becoming sicker and sicker as time just went on. Not even a month after we married, I lost my job and was homebound while my husband worked second shift, which was 4pm to 3am. He would arrive home around 4am, leaving me alone most of the time. My parents and younger brother live close by, perhaps a, a 10 minute drive at most, but at the moment, my mother, who is a school teacher and father works in a factory, were unable to watch over me. They called as frequently as they could, but... And that was all that they could really do. In May, I was told by doctors that I was literally at death's door and unless something happened quick, my family was going to lose me. I was given medications to help with the panic attacks and to get me to eat and all that sort of stuff. But they wanted to hospitalize me, but I refused. My parents decided that when they and my younger brother went to Florida the next month, they were taking me with them too. Again, Keep in mind, I am both anxious and extremely sick. Around this time, the real issues began though. Not with me, but with our neighbours. See, we've never actually met our neighbours personally. My husband lived in the trailer for a month on his own before we married, and he always said that they were really odd, but they didn't seem to be of any concern really. However, once I came into the picture, that all changed. The person who lived in the trailer before us was actually a cousin of mine who rented from another cousin and his wife who lived states away. 
Nora was a huge druggie and a drug dealer, so people got used to getting their fixes and drugs at the trailer we now live in. Then, a few months before we moved in, she got into trouble with the law and landed in jail for some time. I guess our neighbours, who, according to our landlords, were drug addicts and raging alcoholics as well, thought that perhaps she was back. I'm not quite sure. I suppose that maybe it was because I was so sick and my husband slept when he could from both working odd hours and taking care of me, but they never actually saw us. But they just knew that someone was there. They became active at night though, and during the day, they were pretty much quiet. Every once in a while, they would do something outside, but for the most part, nothing really happened. It was always after my husband left for work, and my car was still there, which should have told them that at least someone was still home, right? It started off innocently enough, too, driving up and down in front of the house, parking in the road directly in front of it, and waiting. They'd honk the horn, but I'd ignore them, and several times I called my parents, asking them what to do. They said for the time to just try and ignore them because they thought that Nora was back and after some time they'd get the hint that it was new people and just leave me alone. So I did just that, for a time at least. When they started driving up the driveway though and stopping at the porch, that's when I first called the cops. All I was told was that as long as they didn't encroach on my actual property, there was nothing that they could do. They advised me to turn on the lights to my house to signal that I was home. I couldn't sleep, despite needing to. I had mono and panic disorder and depression, and I desperately needed sleep, though. My husband had the weekends off, and you can guess it. No issues during the weekends. It was just really insane and infuriating, to be honest, and everyone believed me when I said I was having problems, but there was only so much that they could do. My father-in-law brought over one of his shotguns, a 12-gauge, knowing that I was a pretty good shot. He told me to use it if need be. Another background thing too is that I shot trap for years and when I was 18, I placed second in districts. I chose not to go to state, but knowing I was good enough for second was a, a proud moment for me. My father-in-law made me promise too that I would use it if it came to it, so I did. So one night, my husband was at work and I guess my body finally shut down. I fell asleep for once, only to be woken up around 1am by the sound of our neighbor's truck tearing out from behind the trailer. I jumped up and looked outside to see them driving out of our driveway. They started speeding up and down the front of the house and I called the cops again. I called my dad and my mum and my dad came over because I was in a full panic attack. My dad called my husband too, who came home immediately, and there were tire marks in the grass behind the trailer, but they couldn't necessarily prove that it was them, despite me describing their truck down to the dents. My dad told the cops that this had been going on long enough, but again, not enough evidence or proof. A week, and just one more week until I could go with my family to Florida. Somehow, I managed to be a bridesmaid in my older brother's wedding too, despite being so sick. I was doped up on medications to keep me calm so I wouldn't have a panic attack and, to be honest, I don't recall much about that day other than it poured rain. My husband naturally was at work and I was sitting at home and our two cats asleep rather soundly. I was playing my 3DS, a Stories of Seasons, relaxing, with Markiplier on the TV for a background noise and... The time was around midnight, I'd say, when my cat suddenly woke up and came unglued. They ran to the side door and then to the front door, growling and hissing and their hair on end. They had never behaved that way, so I started to get up to see what it was that they were freaking out about, and that's when I heard it. Someone whispered, how are we going to do this? I froze, and I heard them. I heard their footsteps as they walked up and down the front porch. I wasn't sure how many there were, but I know for a fact that there had to be at least three men outside. My curtains were closed and most of the lights were off, but the TV was on, and surely they heard Markiplier's eccentric volume, right? They had gotten quieter, and I heard their footsteps on the porch again. I grabbed my phone, shakily swiping until I found my dad's number and called him. I remember breathing hard and feeling a panic attack setting in. Hello? Dad, 
They're here. They're here, on the porch. They want to get in. Listen, I'm on my way. J just call the cops, okay? I hung up with him and then heard them talking amongst themselves on how they wanted to break in, what they wanted, and all that sort of stuff. I ran into the bedroom, grabbed the 12 gauge, opened the chamber to see it fully loaded and then called the cops. I left the lights off, I decided I was going to have them caught this time and I wasn't going to run them off. The dispatch answered and I told him what was going on. As sick as I was, I managed to hold the shotgun to my shoulder and pointed it at the door, remembering everything my dad taught me about shooting while I was a hunter and when I shot trap. But I was still scared out of my mind. Although, somehow, I, I managed to keep my panic attack down, but I was still breathing really hard. Listen, calm your breathing, hun. You said they're outside, right? Yeah, I heard one say that they heard me, and then the other said that it wouldn't be a problem. They're coming, sweetie, I promise. I'm armed, though, okay? Excuse me? I'm armed! I yelled, hoping that they'd hear me. With what, sweetheart? A 12 gauge. They won't hurt me. I'm not going to let them. She's armed, guys. I heard him tell the police, who I suppose were on their way. I heard armed from one of the guys outside, and then silence. I heard their footsteps leaving, and then saw the lights to my dad's truck. My dad's here, I said, and I lowered the shotgun and ran outside, my dad and my younger brother running out of the truck. My dad had the judge in his hand, which is a pistol that shoots 12 gauge rounds. It feels like a fucking hand cannon. You'd swear you'd broken your wrist, to be honest. While my younger brother was holding a knife. I told the operator that it was my dad and my brother, and they're armed too, and they said, okay, what of the men? I said, I don't see them, and they said, when the cops get there, make sure to disarm yourselves. I thanked the dispatcher for everything, and about this time... The cops pulled up. I told my dad and younger brother to disarm themselves, so they put their weapons in the truck while I took my gun inside and sat it in the kitchen on top of our dinner table. My dad told me to get back in the house and for my younger brother to go with me. As soon as I stepped inside, the panic attack, it hit me. My dad came inside for a moment and hugged me, telling me how brave I'd been, especially for holding it as long as I did. Shaking, crying, gasping for breath, I listened as he went back outside. The cops found footprints and an area on the porch where the men had tried to break in at one point, but the men had scattered at this point, leaving it difficult for cops to trace exactly where they'd come from. My dad told them that it was the neighbours and my landlords actually called and told the cops that it was more than likely our neighbours as well, who had apparently been giving my cousin who lives up the road a difficult time as well. The cops did notice some of the footprints went into the neighbour's yard, but they weren't home, of course. I remember my dad and younger brother standing outside just as the cops pulled up, yelling as loudly as they could that they would drop them if they ever so much saw them around me again. And my dad was yelling, enough is enough, over and over again. She's sick, she needs rest, I leave her the hell alone, I'll drop your ass, I swear to God. And I noticed that he was actually crying. My dad just isn't the type of person to do that. My whole life, I've seen my dad cry maybe a handful of times. When he talked about his deceased father and when my mum's mum died, or when the doctors told me that I was on death's door and when my younger brother was born. There's a 10 years difference between me and him and 12 between him and his older brother. My dad had been scared that he wouldn't get there in time and maybe, just maybe, I would hesitate to protect myself but I had made up my mind and I wasn't going to let them get away with it anymore. That night, my husband came home and hugged me really tightly. I thought my lungs were going to burst in fact and my younger brother texted me what was going on but reassured him that I was okay. A week later, I went to Florida and time went on and I'm still getting better. As for my neighbours, well, I haven't had problems from them again. I'm not sure if it was the cops actually going to their house or if it was my dad and younger brother threatening them or maybe it was me, them hearing me say that I was armed. Uh, I don't know and to be honest, I don't care. They're still there but man, do I hope that nothing like this ever happens again.